Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our the web conference uh, tutorial uh, on deep learning on graph for natural language processing. Uh, my name is uh, Lin Fei Wu. Uh, I'm currently a, a principal scientist at the JD.com uh, Silicon Valley Research Center. So this is a joint uh, work with uh, uh, my dear friends, uh, Dr. Yu Chen from the uh, Meta AI and Professor Han Ji from UIC and Amazon, uh, Dr. Yin Yali from the Apple and uh, Professor Bao Niu from the University of Montreal and Miller. So this is today's outline. Uh, so we'll have a three different parts. In the first part, we will talk about why we care about graph for NLP. And uh, we, you, will no, you will notice that, so the graph for uh, machine learning uh, for NLP is really a lot of new topic. It's already um, been a, a very popular topic in the last decade. Um, we will introduce uh, um, some conventional machine learning technique for NLP, uh, but more importantly, in this tutorial, we will focus on a modern technique, especially deep learning technique on graphs. We will introduce some um, popular model and uh, method, and so this will have a very important foundation for introduce other part. In the second part, will be uh, the key cornerstone for DLG for NLP, uh, where we will introduce three parts. The first one. Giving a test sequence, how can we construct graph uh, so that later we can use for various NLP applications? And the second one is how once you have a graph constructed, how can we um, take a full advantage of the various graph representation learning technique for the different NLP problem? And finally, we will also introduce a popular version of uh, um, uh, a model called a graph based encoder decoder model for uh, many different, many uh, LP problems. We will also, in the third part, focus on um, um, five um, popular uh, LP applications, information interaction, machine reading comprehension, natural language generation, test clustering and matching, and test manual qualification. So in the later, we will also have uh, some slides to introduce uh, a demo where we try to showing uh, a recent developer library called uh, the graph for NLP library. So this is the first library for promoting the using of the uh, graph neurons. That's uh, one of the most popular deep learning on graph technique for uh, different NLP applications. And finally, we will conclude this uh, tutorial with a future direction um, and uh, some uh, learning resources. So let's continue to, uh, you know, uh, the key pattern. So the graph is a, a general language for describing and uh, modeling the complex system. So the graph as shown in the right hand side is a very simple data structure. So if you can see this graph, so it's composite by a bunch of the graph node and graph edge. Now here graph node can represent uh, you know, any kind, any um, object that you want to model in your system. And the graph edge is used to model the uh, relationship or similarity between uh, each pair of the graph node. So just give a concrete example here. So you can imagine this is an you know, application from like for example, AI for education domain. This is a teacher sitting graph. So for each teacher node, uh, they can have some of their own attribute. For example, what kind of classes they're teaching? Uh, is teacher junior or senior? Uh, what's the position if in the university? And what's, what's the gender information? For students, you also can have a similar information. So when we talk about the deep learning on graph, we really talk about uh, um, a bunch of the algorithm that take a graph topology and also uh, variance of the signed information uh, as an input. Uh, this signed information could be node type, node attribute, uh, edge type, um, and the edge attributes, all this stuff. But this really depends on how you reformulate your problem. So um, some will be uh, the input. And so graph data is really everywhere, uh, ranging from the social network. And uh, this is very natural way to represent a graph. Uh, if information retrieval domain, for example, in today's modern uh, search and uh, recommendation system, they are often using graph and units for uh, doing the, some part of the work. And uh, in the financial domain, you can formulate this uh, financial transaction graph uh, between the financial institute and the, uh, each customer. And uh, people are also using graph and units for um, modeling the chemical compound for a drug discovery. You are also using graph neurons for modeling like calling control flow graph or data flow graph for do the, doing a, a program analysis. Even in the popular computer video, many people are using graph neurons for 
uh, for example, the uh, high level image reasoning. So graph also have been uh, ubiquitous uh, in using for various uh, LP applications. Uh, so depends on how we use that, typically you can divide them into uh, two types of the graph information we can use using. Uh, why, uh, why NLP is literally used in graph? That's because the human language is a high level language. So it doesn't look like just a test sequence. So when, you are, when our brain processing that it's a language, actually it's a very complicated process. That's why in an NLP domain, there's a long standing problem, for example, using semantic parts of this stuff that really try to uh, analyze the sentence structure, document structure uh, beyond the simple test sequence. So based on that, this uh, different uh, structure information we can uh, generate, uh, for example, if we consider uh, synthetic information like a uh, dependent part tree or constitution tree, we can leverage this type of the, uh, uh, hidden structure information to augment the kind of test sequence so that we generate like a dependent graph or constitution graph. And uh, uh, if we can see about the semantic information, for example, using uh, abstract many representation uh, or using RE graph, then we can use that to uh, generate an uh, MR graph and IE graph so that uh, we can capture the more uh, additional information regarding semantic information. For some application, it's very special. For example, a SQL uh, uh, query, right? You can, you can formulate uh, as, uh, uh, as well know that SQL long, uh, uh, long query is not, uh, uh, is considered by the different clause, but different uh, clause don't really have uh, all the information. So therefore that is better to represent in the SQL graph. Uh, so this is uh, really depends on the application itself to formulate the graph. So um, from the uh, natural language processing, so uh, originally when we talk about to represent a natural language, <clears throat> we typically represent as a background of the tokens, just like shown in the right hand figure, right? So there's three sentences here. So when we try to represent this different sentence, uh, we try to use, uh, treat each of the uh, word as a token. Uh, therefore, therefore, that you know this uh, back word and TFIDF is a very very popular way uh, when we uh, to use to represent the natural language. Uh, but later, people found that so uh, starting from the 2014, uh, people invented this called word vector, uh, global vector. Uh, this uh, a new technique to show you that so by converting or transforming the um, the uh, sparse dense vector into the dense space so that we can represent each of the word token as a vector. And in this embedding space, we can preserve the original, um, the constraints in the, or in the original test sequence. Uh, this way I'll be showing you that, so it's a very well um, long technique to uh, generate a dense representation for each of the word token. So one of the most popular example is a uh, uh, queen uh, plus a woman minus man is, uh, is uh, uh, equal to king. So this is a, a very famous uh, example to show you that the word vector really can capture the semantic meaning. And uh, so in this, in this tutorial, we are more focused on the represent the natural language as a graph. So as uh, beyond the graph, we have just mentioned like a dependent graph, constitution graph, and my graph, all this graph. So even for the simple test graph, right, we can have a multiple hierarchy of the elements. For example, for document, sentence, and word, just as shown in the right-hand side, that we can easily formulate this uh, uh, test graph. Um, so there, therefore, there uh, have um, uh, many graph-based uh, conventional machine learning methods have been developed for variance of the NLP problem. So by the way, this book uh, is uh, uh, written by the uh, Professor uh, Mahase and uh, Radev, published in the 2011. There, uh, in this book, they talk about uh, many different algorithms. For example, for the random work uh, algorithm that have been using to uh, analyze the semantic similarity of the text, where they essentially try to uh, use the random worker method to generate uh, uh, a, statutory, a statutory distribution over the other graph node, so they can, uh, based on the generated random paths. So uh, if we try to uh, compute a test clustering, solve the test clustering problem, uh, so you can also uh, formulate the text as a graph and then using a spectrum clustering, uh, as well as uh, a specialized uh, graph clustering method for uh, test clustering. And uh, if you want to uh, compare the similarity between any two test graphs, uh, you can use in graph matching algorithm to do that. Um, and lastly, uh, but uh, not last, uh, is a label propagation algorithm, uh, where you try to propagate the label uh, from the label of data to the previously unlabeled data point. And uh, 
Once you generate that, you will have all the information for different graph nodes, and then you can use that uh, generated vector to do the water sensor disambulation or sentiment analysis problem. Okay, now let's uh, go to the deep learning graph uh, to introduce some modern technique and method. So this is uh, um, a great uh, summary of uh, recent trend uh, in the machine learning community. So we can see that this uh, graph machine learning uh, technique have uh, been uh, really popular. Uh, and uh, so, but just as we uh, told bef uh, said bef discussed before, so before the, um, the graph uh, machine learning technique is a long standing problem. So uh, it's already uh, in the community for at least two decades. Uh, but starting from the 2016, uh, this is uh, uh, the really uh, uh, a new uh, modern era of the graph deep learning technique that's starting to show it. Uh, it have a great performance. Then starting from there, there are so many papers published in each of the top ranked uh, conference. So this is basically a summary of the uh, graph units. This is one of the most popular technique in a deep learning on graph technique. This is also one of the uh, uh, a technique that will concentrate a lot uh, in this tutorial. So starting from the, so the, now let's take a look at a brief history of uh, the graph units. So uh, in 2009, actually this is the first uh, graph news paper being published. So this is a very interesting uh, timeline uh, because this is uh, even before, uh, you know, uh, the deep learning technique really become a very dominant method from the 2012. Uh, so in 2016 and 17, so people have been developed the first GIU-based modern uh, graph neural network called graph gated neural network. That is a really uh, modern modification for the 2009 paper. And uh, so this paper is, uh, so later uh, the second paper called the graph convolution network. This is the first graph convolution based method. Uh, so this is really starting a new era of the graph uh, neural history because uh, since this paper, people found that uh, so we can use a very simple computation uh, to do the graph com uh, graph units and, and also showing a, a greater performance. So from the 2017 and the 21, uh, they have, the researchers have been developed a series of the uh, graph convolution based method and graph messaging, passing based method, attention based method, and even many unsupervised graph units. So there are still many uh, new graph units uh, methods have been developed. But uh, that's being said that uh, so uh, there's really a, a lot of the graph units have been developed more and more and uh, they are also have been formulated a lot of the classic graph neural methods now. So because of that, so graph neural are also have been using it for the various applications. So we often see that there's a gap between the industry and the academia. So it's about two or three years gap. So once the method become mature and mature, uh, pu uh, the industry people were starting to use that for their own uh, industry applications. So such as like uh, searching recommendation, drug discovery, ALV transportation, and so on and so forth. We are seeing uh, many of the very good uh, open source of GitLab uh, for the graph uh, neural net, for example, uh, graph, uh, deep graph learning method, Python geometric. We are also seeing uh, many uh, in, um, specialized, uh, uh, some uh, specialized uh, uh, library that have been developed for a specific domain, for example, uh, our graph NLP uh, library uh, uh, and also the Torch drug discovery library is for the drug discovery using graph neural nets. And at the same time, so we see uh, a bunch of the books that have been released uh, you know, to comprehensively summarize the technique in this domain. So, uh, so in, uh, in 2021, the three graph news book uh, from Professor Niu, uh, the introduction of the graph and neural nets and uh, uh, Professor uh, Jinlian Tang from MSU, uh, deep, learning graph, uh, deep learning on graph and Professor Hamilton uh, from the uh, called the graph representation learning. And in early this year, we also released uh, a new uh, graph and neural book uh, called the Graph and Neural uh, Foundation Frontiers and Education. So this is uh, so far the most comprehensive uh, graph and neural book. And uh, if you have interest, you know, you are welcome to check out these books. And uh, next, uh, I will switch uh, to my uh, friends, uh, Yuchen, to continue this uh, tutorial. Thanks, Linpei. Uh, let me share my screen. Yes, uh, so in this part, we will have a, a deeper look um, into the graph neural networks foundations. So um, let's first see like, uh, so what, basically like what is the graph neural network? 
So uh, graph neural networks um, like le uh, learns embeddings for like for each node in the graph and uh, aggregated the node embeddings to produce the uh, graph embeddings. Uh, generally, the learning process of a uh, node embedding like utilizes the graph structure and the input node embeddings. So this process is also uh, named as graph filtering. Mm, and we can see from this uh, formula, the uh, F filter is, uh, is the graph uh, filtering operation operator, which takes as input uh, an adjacency matrix of the graph structure and the input node embeddings, and is able to uh, learn updated node embeddings. So uh, like specific uh, graph neural networks differ in like how the graph filter is chosen and uh, parameterized. The graph filtering does not change uh, the structure of the graph, but it refines the node embeddings. And we can stack multiple uh, graph filters in order to uh, capture the long range uh, dependency and also to generate the final uh, node embeddings. So there are different uh, types of graph filters and uh, in general, we can ca categorize them into uh, four categories, including the spatial base, the spatial base, the attention base, and the so recursion base. So uh, sorry? So could you okay. mute yourself if you are not presenting? Uh, okay, uh, so let's go, uh, uh, let's continue. So uh, yeah, so there are like, uh, in general, we can have like those four different kind of graph filters, and uh, um, I'll talk uh, more about them uh, in the later slides. So, um, so since graph filtering like does not change the graph structure, pooling operations are introduced to aggregate node embeddings to generate uh, graph level uh, embeddings. Graph pooling takes a graph and its node embeddings as inputs, and then generates a smaller uh, graph with few nodes and its corresponding like updated node embeddings. So the graph pooling layers can also be uh, classified, can be classified into two categories. Uh, one is called a uh, flat graph pooling and the other is called hierarchical uh, graph pooling. So the flat graph pooling uh, generates the graph level representation directly from the node embeddings in just a single step. So here, uh, here are some like uh, commonly used uh, flat graph pooling op uh, operation, for, for example, like the max pooling average pooling and the mean pooling. So those are very similar to what we have in like uh, in, in convolution, convolutional neural networks. And in contrast, the hierarchical uh, graph pooling con contains several graph pooling layers. And each of the pooling layer follows uh, like a stack of uh, graph filter. So hierarchical uh, graph pooling um, concerns the graphs step by step in order to learn the final graph level uh, embeddings. So, so graph neural networks have like gained increasing attention as a special class of uh, neural networks, which can like model arbitrary graph structured uh, uh, data. So uh, uh, here let's have a like brief overview of how our basic graph neural networks uh, works. So here the key idea is like um, to leverage the neighboring node embeddings in order to update the targeted node embeddings. So let's take a look into uh, like this diagram. So uh, in order to uh, learn the node embeddings of our targeted node, uh, node A, so we can aggregate the, the information from all its neighboring nodes. So we have uh, B, C, and D in this uh, case. And in order to learn the node embeddings of uh, its, node embed its neighboring node, for example, node B, we can further like incorporate the information from B's neighboring nodes, which include node A and N. And C. So we can repeat this process uh, by stacking uh, multiple uh, graph filters. And uh, uh, to the end, we can incorporate information uh, from distant uh, neighboring nodes um, of A in order to learn a better, uh, in order to learn a like, good representation of uh, node A. So that's basically how the uh, graph neural network works. And uh, yeah, so intuitively, uh, when we doing when we do this kind of uh, uh, node embedding, uh, like uh, up aggregation and update, uh, like each actually like a, um, the network neighborhood actually defines a, some kind of like a computation graph, as we can see here. Mm, so, so let's take a deeper look into the neighborhood aggregation step. 
So here, um, that is the first layer. So we can initialize the node embeddings with the like raw node features. And then we can stack uh, many graph neural network layers to increase the receptive field for learning the embeddings uh, for a targeted node. If we stack like K layers, basically we a K hop neighboring node information will be incorporated in order to update the node embedding of a targeted node. And we can actually take another view of this uh, process, which is uh, from the perspective of messaging, uh, message passing. So uh, I will talk a little bit more about that uh, in later like slides, but the idea is that we actually are propagating the node embedding information across the whole graph. And uh, the deeper the graph neural network is, and the, the further the information can be uh, propagated. And uh, mm, here, like uh, one thing to note is that like stacking very deep graph neural networks might lead to some uh, over like smoothing issue, meaning that like all the nodes might have very similar embeddings after applying too many uh, graph neural network layers. And this is actually a very active uh, research topic, um, like on how to overcome the over, over smoothing issues of very deep graph neural networks. Okay, so um, so let's have a like um, like a over overview of like applying graph neural network based models uh, in practice. So this uh, uh, this process can be decomposed into like the, the following steps. So first, we will need to uh, define the node aggregation and uh, node update uh, functions. So the node aggregation. Uh, uh, function is used to aggregate the neighboring nodes, uh, node embeddings uh, uh, for a targeted node. And the node update function uh, is defined to, uh, to kind of incorporate the aggregated node embeddings uh, in order to update the embedding of the current targeted node. And the second step, we will need to define our loss function on the node embeddings. So this really a task dependent, like we can do uh, node classification task, then we can define the loss on the uh, on the node level uh, by using the the, the, the updated uh, uh, node embeddings from a uh, graph neural network. And the uh, third step, we will need to train the neural network um, uh, set of nodes. So usually we can do supervised learning, but we can also do unsupervised learning. And uh, then we can during the inference time, like we can generate an uh, node embeddings for, for the nodes uh, as needed. And we can even do inductive learning, meaning that we can uh, generate, the, uh, we can use the train graph neural network to generate the node embeddings for those unseen nodes uh, uh, in the training uh, process, uh, training phase. Okay, so let's have a case study um, on a graph neural network. So uh, as we um, like already uh, discussed, so the basic uh, idea is, uh, is that to, we, we aggregate the neighboring node embeddings to update the current targeted node embeddings. So there are many ways to, to, uh, to de design the uh, aggregation uh, function. One simple idea is to do just do average uh, aggregation. So meaning that we just uh, compute the average of all the neighboring node embeddings to get a node aggregated in embedding. And then we can apply our neural network to, to incorporate the uh, aggregate, aggregated node embeddings in order to update the targeted node embedding. So um, a simple way to uh, like uh, to um, a simple way to to do this is that uh, uh, I think we can take a like take this uh, this formula uh, this equation for example. Like here we have uh, uh, this part this red block actually is the average uh, aggregation function. And uh, uh, this whole like, uh, this whole like a part of sig uh, sigma part is actually a, a updated function, which takes as input the aggregated uh, node embedding and the previous layers embedding of the targeted node V. And uh, it also introduced some like uh, trainable uh, weights and uh, like bias factors. And uh, we can apply some uh, non-activity uh, so non-linearity -linear activation function in order to update the uh, node embeddings. So this is just one uh, like uh, example 
of like how we can define the aggregation function and the node no, and the updated functions in order to uh, learn node embeddings um, based on its neighboring uh, like a node embeddings. So let's have a quick summary um, of we of what, what we just have like discussed. So the key idea of a graph neural network is to generate node embeddings by aggregating the neighboring uh, in neighborhood information. And it allows for parameter sharing uh, because we can share uh, the, the neural network parameter across, across um, all the nodes. So we can, we can take a deeper look into the previous equation. So all those uh, learnable parameters like WK, DK, uh, they are actually shared by uh, different nodes. So this allows like a, a parameter sharing, which is kind of similar to we are, we we have, we have like a parameter sharing in convolutional neural networks, and uh, a graph neural network also allows for like uh, inductive learning because we can generate uh, node embeddings for unseen nodes uh, uh, during the inference uh, phase. Okay, so uh, so uh, since we have uh, taken uh, like overview of uh, how basic graph neural networks. And uh, let's now uh, continue to take, uh, I mean, I have like an overview of some very popular graph neural networks. So as we previously mentioned, uh, we can categorize graph neural networks into like uh, four categories based on their uh, graph filter uh, design. Um, so which include uh, the special based graph filters as the spatial based, as attention based, and the recurrent based graph filters. Uh, in this uh, in this part, let's take a deeper look into how those uh, different graph filters are designed and what are the representative graph neural networks. Let's first uh, take a look into the like spatial uh, based graph filter. So the spatial uh, in general, like the spatial convolution on graphs, is defined as the multiplication of a signal x i. Uh, with some with some graph filter, and the graph filter is parameterized by some uh, uh, parameters like a data in the Fourier domain. And in this equation, we have u and uh, uh, lambda. So they are eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the normalized graph representation of the uh, of the input graph. So, however, like uh, it's very Expensive to compute the full eigen decomposition of the normalized graph Laplace. So previous works um, proposed to use the truncated ex expansion in terms uh, uh, in terms of like the uh, the Chebyshev uh, polynomials up to the piece order in order to offer uh, to approximate the the full eigen decomposition. So uh, here we can see this uh, second equation actually uh, computes a case like. Uh, uh, a piece order, a piece order uh, polynomial in the Laplace, so which shows that like every central node that depends only on nodes in the in the p-hop uh, range. So therefore, a neural network uh, model based on graph convolution can stack uh, multiple such uh, convolution layers. So, um, like later work, uh, either uh, uh, later work like either uh, even like uh, further like proposed to limit the layer-wise convolution operation to, to only the first order and, uh, and, and also stack, uh, stack the multiple such convolutional layers. So by doing that, we get the uh, multi-layer graph convolutional network, uh, which is uh, GCN. So basically GCN adopts the first order uh, of uh, approximation of the, the Chebyshev uh, polynomial we just saw and it applied some other tricks like a renormalization trick in order to uh, stabilize the numerical computation of uh, those like this, like this kind of multi-layer computation. And uh, the graph, new, graph convolutional network like has been applied in many uh, NLP tasks, for example, like text classification, uh, question answering, uh, text matching, and so on. Um, let's next uh, next let's uh, move to uh, another type of uh, graph neural network, which is called uh, uh, spatial based uh, graph neural networks. So um, uh, analogous to the convolutional operation of a conventional like CNN, 
uh, spatial based graph filters operate on the graph convolutions uh, based on unknown spatial relations. So the spatial based graph filters hold the idea of information propagation, uh, which is also called uh, message passing. So the spatial based graph uh, convolution operation essentially propagates the node information as uh, messages along the uh, edges and across the whole graph. So message passing uh, neural network uh, proposed a uh, general framework of spatial based graph filters, which is a composition function consisting of ag aggregation and update functions. So we have already uh, talked about it, like these two uh, concepts in the, in the previous slides. So these it treats NPN like treats the graph convolution as a message passing process in which uh, the information can be passed from one node to another along the edges directly. And NPN runs like k-step message passing iterations in order to let the information propagate further to k, k hub neighboring node. Now this is also uh, this is very important because uh, by doing that we can capture the, like a long range uh, dependencies. And uh, if we look and take a look into the, the the formula, it includes both the node and edge embeddings. So um, However, like uh, it's kind of expensive if we consider all the neighboring nodes, especially for those large uh, graphs. So, um, and there are some like uh, follow-up works which tries which try to improve the efficiency of a general NPN uh, framework. Uh, GraphSage is uh, is a very good example uh, in this kind. So, GraphSage uh, adopts the sampling uh, uh, strategy. Uh, to obtain a fixed number of neighbors for each node. So here, uh, NVI, um, NVI um, is, the, is, a, is the equation, uh, which is uh, like a random sample of the neighboring nodes of node VI. And the aggregation function here can be any functions that are invariant to the permutations of node, node orderings. Uh, so uh, the aggregation functions can be a mean, uh, sum, or max, uh, operations and in, in the graph stage uh, model, uh, only the node embeddings uh, are considered. So it does not consider the edge embeddings um, as in the general uh, NPN network. And the graph stage and NPN have been applied in many NLP tasks, like including like no, uh, knowledge graph, some knowledge graph related applications, the information extraction, many parsing, and so on. And let's Next, let's talk about uh, graph attention networks. So um, the original versions of like GNs take edge connections of the input graph as fixed and do not dynamically adjust the uh, connecti connectivity information during the graph learning process. So it e treats equally all the, uh, all, the, all the neighboring nodes when updating the target node embeddings. So inspired by the successful applications of multi-head uh, self-attention mechanism in transformer models, so graph attention networks was proposed to introduce the multi-head attention uh, mechanism to the GN architecture. Um, the idea is to, so, uh, so by doing that, uh, we are able to like dynamically learn the, the, the attention weights on the edges when performing the message passing. And the assumption here is that uh, some neighboring nodes might be more important than others when updating the targeted node embeddings. And more specifically, when aggregating embeddings from the neighboring nodes for each targeted node uh, in the graph, the, semant the semantic similarity uh, between the, the targeted node and each neighboring node will be, uh, will be um, like considered by this muddy head um, uh, self-attention mechanism and the important neighboring nodes will be assigned a higher attention scores uh, when performing the neighborhood uh, like aggregation. And the graph attention network has been also been applied in many NLP uh, tasks like text clarification, question answering, and so on. So, uh, so our, uh, our, our last type of graph neural networks is called the uh, it's, it's like uh, recurrent based uh, graph neural networks. And a typical example of uh, 
a such graph uh, neural network is the gated uh, graph neural networks. So the biggest uh, motivation, uh, uh, like a from typical graph neural networks to this uh, gated uh, graph neural networks is the use of the gated uh, recurrent units, uh, while also taking into account the edge type and the edge directions when doing the uh, when doing the known neighborhood aggregation. So as we can see here, uh, the the GGN, the gated graph neural network, aggregates information from neighboring nodes via both the incoming and outgoing uh, edges. And a GRU, a gated recurrent unit, uh, is applied to update the target node embeddings by incorporating the aggregated node embeddings to the node embeddings uh, at the previous uh, time step L by one. So um, I think by using the gated uh, recurrent Gated recurrent unit. Actually, we are allow we allow parameter share, sharing across different uh, GN layers. So for like uh, for GCN graph stage, uh, at each uh, layer we will have at each uh, GN layer we will have different parameters. Uh, but here in as for gated uh, graph neural networks, actually uh, we allow parameter sharing across um, across different graph neural network layers because we have this. Uh, gated recurrent unit. This is very similar to uh, what we have in uh, like LSTM uh, model. And uh, by the way, GGN has also been uh, applied in many NLP tasks like semantic parsing and machine translation and so on. Okay, so uh, let's take a look into our uh, load map of this tutorial. So we have introduced the, uh, the key foundations of graph neural networks. And in the rest of this tutorial, we will uh, talk about the uh, key foundations of uh, deep learning on graphs for natural language processing. And uh, we, will, uh, we, we, will, we will talk about like different applications of GNs in various NLP tasks. And then later we will have an introduction uh, to the graph NLP library, which is the first library, open source library for the issues of graph neural networks for NLP. And we will mention some uh, promising future directions in this uh, DLG for NLP field. Okay, uh, yeah, let's move to the uh, DLG for NLP foundations uh, part. So the first topic uh, is actually a graph construction for NLP. So uh, as we previously introduced, like there are three uh, typical ways of, uh, like of representing text, which are back. Um, sequence and a graph, like among all the three approaches, a uh, graph has the strongest representation power because it can capture rich and diverse information um, about the text. So we know that different NLP tasks require different aspects of the text, such as uh, syntax, uh, semantics. So in the meanwhile, different graphs capture different aspects of the text. So therefore, um, how to convert a text to a graph is an important yet challenging a question, which really depends on like what uh, aspects of information we want to capture in a text graph. In general, we, uh, we can group the various graph construction approaches into two categories. Uh, one is static graph construction and the other is called uh, dynamic graph construction. So um, we will introduce each of them and uh, summarize their, uh, their properties next. So uh, note that uh, the primary goal of graph construction here is uh, to achieve a good downstream task performance. Uh, let's first talk about a static graph uh, construction. So uh, it aims to convert the raw text to a graph where text can be a sentence, a paragraph, a document, corpus, and so on. This is usually conducted during the pre-processing stage by augmenting the raw text with various domain knowledge. Uh, such as syntax, semantics, topics, co-occurrence, and uh, word knowledge. Many static graph construction approaches used in practice are driven by uh, particular NLP applications and incorporate a hybrid prior knowledge about the data and the task. Let's see some representative uh, stat static graph construction approaches for NLP, which are widely used in the existing uh, literature. So the first static graph uh, construction approach we are going to introduce here is uh, dependency graph construction. So dependency parsing aims to assign uh, 
tree structure to a sentence which describes a set of directed uh, uh, grammatic relations holding among the words in the text. So it can help uh, extract a subject, verb, object, or triples, which are often indicative of semantic relations between the predicates, making it directly useful for many NLP applications, such as information extraction, semantic parsing, call uh, reference resolution, and a question answering. So for instance, we are given a sentence, um, uh, the uh, like other jobs outside Austin. So one can apply dependency parsing tools to convert it into a graph. Uh, but what if we have like multiple uh, such a sentence in a text? So one common way is to add additional uh, sequential edges between nodes so that we can connect uh, multiple dependency graphs in a graph, in, in, a, in a paragraph. Besides, uh, by doing that, we can also reserve sequential information in the raw text, which can be helpful in some applications. Uh, the next approach uh, we, we will talk about here is uh, called constituency graph construction. The, con the, uh, the constituency graph is able to capture phrase-based syntactic relations in a sentence. For instance, uh, given a sentence, um, uh, one can apply constituency parsing tools to convert it into a, constitu uh, in into a graph like uh, this. And due for the same reason, we, we, we can also add additional sequential edges between the nodes. And uh, the AMR graph captures variant semantic information of the sentences, such as the semantic laws, uh, within sentence called reference, name entities, and so on. So they preserve the semantic meanings of text while ab abstracting away from syntactic representations. And it can help uh, complete the raw text by providing high level abstract uh, information. So given a sentence, post description of himself a fighter, one can apply AMR parsing tools to convert it to a, a graph. The IE graph aims to extract the structure information from text to represent the high level information about entities and their relations. So uh, given an input sentence, one can apply uh, IE tools to convert it to a graph which contains entities such as uh, Seattle's as nodes and the relations uh, such as attended as edges. Uh, call reference uh, resolution is usually conducted to uh, to group entities referring to the referring to the um, same concept to a single node. So, uh, for example, here, uh, like Paul, he a renowned uh, computer scientist. They all refer to the same person. So we can group them into a single node in the final IE graph. The knowledge graph uh, stores world knowledge about entities and their relations. So, given a question who acted in the movies uh, direct, directed by the uh, director of some mother's son. So one can first identify the top entity of this question, which is some mother's son, and then extract a subgraph for, from a knowledge graph, which surrounds the top entity and hopefully contains the answer entities of this question. A uh, topic is a subject that a uh, text is about. So different documents might mention overlapping topics. Um, with that, we can discover the relations among documents by comparing their, uh, uh, their, their topics. And another way to find the connections about, uh, among text is to compute their pairwise similarity scores. And one common way to compute the similarity scores is to, to first embed the text into some vector representations, uh, such as TFIDF scores vectors, and then we can compute a pairwise similarity in that uh, embedding space. In order to capture the word occurrence, co-occurrence information, one can regard the co-occurrence matrix as an adjacency matrix. And then we can construct, construct a graph containing each unique word as a node. Uh, some logic forms such as SQL query can also be naturally represented as a graph which well captures the relations among various objects. Uh, so far, we have discussed the many uh, common static graph construction um, approaches, uh, which preserve some kind of uh, prior or domain knowledge. So in practice, um, um, it might be beneficial to conduct some hybrid graph, graph uh, capturing multiple source or sources of prior or domain knowledge, which is 
tightly coupled to the NLP task at hand. So as we already seen, static graph construction operates by augmenting text with variance uh, domain knowledge during the pre-processing um, stage, uh, including syntax, semantics, topics, concurrence, word knowledge, and so on. For each type of domain knowledge, there are various uh, types of graphs we can construct. So which that static graph to construct really depends on the specific NLP applications. For example, um, for multi-hub MRC, uh, for multi-hub uh, machine reading comprehension task, uh, entities and uh, entity co-reference co across documents are very important. As we will see in the application part of this tutorial, Mm, these static graph construction approaches are widely used in various NLP applications, such as natural language generation, reading comprehension, and uh, semantic parsing. So next, we will introduce a dynamic graph construction, which shares the same goal with the static graph construction, but unlike the static graph construction, which is performed during the pre-processing stage, a dynamic graph construction operates by jointly learning the graph structure and the graph representations on the fly. So the ultimate goal is to learn the optimized graph structure and the representations with respect to certain uh, downstream NLP tasks. Uh, we summarize the typical dynamic graph construction pipeline as follows, given a set of data points, which can stand for various NLP elements such as words, sentences and documents, we first apply graph similarity metric learning, which aims to capture the pairwise node similarity and the returns the fully connected weighted graph. Then uh, we can optionally apply graph specification operations in order to obtain a sparse graph, which is uh, usually more mm, meaningful in real world applications. And it's also more computational uh, uh, inexpensive. Um, if the input data is instead of data points, but an intrinsic graph containing uh, initial edge edges, uh, we can also optionally uh, combine the intrinsic graph and the and the learned graph uh, learned implicit graph to form an augmented graph. The output graph will be consumed by a subsequent gen based model in order to learn the graph uh, representations and uh, predict uh, outputs. Uh, next, we will introduce each of the four dynamic graph construction techniques, which we summarize from the existing practice of its applications in the NLP field. Uh, these include uh, graph similarity magic learning techniques, uh, graph specification techniques, um, how to combine intrinsic graph structure and the implicitly uh, graph structures and the various uh, learning paradigms. So the idea of graph similarity magic learning is to compute the pairwise node similarity in the node embedding uh, space and obtain an adjacency matrix based on that. It can enable inductive learning because once the similarity metric learning is finished, uh, one can apply it to unseen nodes uh, to learn a graph. This is important for many NLP applications because we, we want to learn a new graph for each uh, text example. So variance metric functions have been proposed by previous works. And here we group uh, those uh, metric functions into two categories. One is called node embedding based similarity metric learning and the other is called stru structure aware similarity metric learning. Um, let's first talk about the, the node embedding based uh, similarity metric learning. So uh, we are given a set of data points and they are vector representations. And uh, we can apply various metric functions to learn pairwise node similarity. And the output is a weighted adjacency matrix, which is corresponding to a fully connected weighted graph. So common uh, matrix uh, functions include attention-based and, uh, and uh, cosine-based functions. Uh, let's first uh, uh, talk about the attention-based uh, node similarity metric uh, functions. So uh, invariant one, uh, here VI is the node embedding and U is the non-negative weight vector, uh, learning to highlight the different dimensions of the node embeddings. And invariant two, uh, 
Uh, here, W is a learnable weight matrix which maps the node embedding to a latent space. And uh, the ReLU activation function is used to enforce the sparsity of the similarity matrix. So in both variants, uh, data products is used to compute the pairwise node similarity. And that's the example of cosine-based uh, uh, metric function. So here, um, WP is a weight vector associated uh, to the piece perspective and it has the same dimension as the node embeddings. Intuitively, uh, SIJP uh, computes the pairwise cosine similarity for the piece perspective, where each perspective considers one part of the semantics captured in the embeddings. So we can also average like the multi-header similarity scores to increase the learning power of magic. So this is uh, similar to the idea of multi-head uh, attention in transformer models. Now let's talk about the structure of where similarity metric learning. Unlike the previous, previously mentioned uh, node embedding based similarity uh, metric learning, uh, so this metric learning approach in addition uh, considers the existing edge information of the intrinsic graph uh, when it's valuable. Uh, let's see some example uh, metric functions. So in, in both of these two uh, variants, attention-based function is applied and, and notably edge embeddings of the intrinsic graph play an important role uh, in learning the implicit uh, graph structure. So that's why we call it uh, uh, structure-aware similarity metric learning functions. So, so far, we uh, similarity metric functions learn a fully connected graph. However, a fully connected graph is computationally expensive and it might introduce uh, uh, noise and we might want to enforce sparsity to the learner graph structure to obtain a sparse graph by leveraging uh, various techniques uh, such as what we uh, list as follows. And we will talk about each of them. And for KN style uh, sparsification, uh, for each node, uh, only the K nearest the neighbors um, and the associated uh, similarity scores are kept and all the remaining similarity scores uh, will be masked off. For absolute neighborhood uh, specification, so those elements in the similarity uh, matrix S, uh, which are smaller than a non-negative threshold uh, epsilon, uh, are all masked off. So besides explicitly uh, enforcing the sparsity of the learner graph by applying certain form of threshold, whether it's K or epsilon, sparsity can also be enforced implicitly in a learning-based manner. Uh, for example, we can apply certain form of graph regularization to the learned adjacency matrix. Some common way, some common types of graph regularization include like uh, the um, we, we can apply some L, uh, we can apply some like uh, uh, F norm to the uh, learned adjacency matrix. Uh, the intrinsic graph typically still carries rich and useful information regarding the uh, optimal graph structure for the downstream task. So in recent works proposed to uh, combine the learned implicit graph structure with the intrinsic graph structure based on the assumption that the learned implicit graph is potentially a shift uh, from the intrinsic graph structure, which is supplementary to the intrinsic graph structure. So one common way to, uh, to do this is to compute a linear combination of the normalized graph Laplacian of the intrinsic graph structure and the normalized adjacency matrix of the implicitly learned graph structure. And we can apply various normalization operations here to the learned adjacency matrix, such as graph Laplacian or raw normalization. So now let's talk about some important uh, learning paradigms for dynamic graph construction, which have been explored so far. Most existing dynamic graph construction approaches for GNNs consist of two a uh, key learning component, uh, the, graph, the graph structure learning and the graph representation learning components. The most straightforward uh, strategy is to jointly uh, optimize the whole learning system in an end-to-end -end manner uh, towards the, um, the downstream, uh, downstream uh, prediction task. Another common strategy is to adaptively learn the input graph structure to each uh, stack 
stacked GN layer to reflect the changes of the intermediate graph representations. Mm. This kind of uh, strategy is similar to uh, like how our transformer models learn different weighted the uh, fully connected graphs in each layer. But one difference is here we we are learning a sparse graph instead of a, a fully connected graph uh, uh, for each uh, GN layer. So unlike the above two paradigms, a recent work proposed that an interactive graph learning framework by learning a better uh, graph structure based on uh, better graph representations. And in the meanwhile, um, learning better graph representations based on a better graph structure in an iterative manner. And as a result, uh, this iterative paradigm repeatedly refines the graph structure and the graph representations toward the optimal downstream performance. So variance uh, stopping uh, conditions can be applied for this iterative learning process. For example, uh, we can stop the iterative process when the difference between the learned adjacency matrix and the consecutive iterations is uh, small enough. So far, we have introduced the various uh, dynamic graph construction techniques, uh, including the graph similarity metric learning, the graph specification, how to combine intrinsic and the implicit uh, graph structures and the various uh, learning paradigms. So one might ask, uh, how is static graph conjunction compared with the dynamic graph conjunction? So which one uh, is better? So let's first talk about the static graph conjunction. The, the biggest uh, advantage is it can easily encode the pr rich prior knowledge in the, graph, in, in the graph, which can be very helpful for certain NLP applications. Uh, but this can also become a downside when it's inexpensive or not doable to obtain such ex extensive domain expertise. For example, uh, for some uh, low resource um, languages, we might not have rich prime knowledge to utilize. Besides static graph conjunction is um, error prone due to noisy, uh, noise or incomplete graph. And this is, and therefore it's often like a suboptimal. So due to its disjoint graph structure, graph construction and the representation learning nature, it can also lead to LO uh, accumulation. Uh, compared to static graph construction, uh, dynamic graph construction is, uh, is quite a new and has uh, not been extensively studied in the NLG for NLP area, DLG for NLP area. Its advantages include the requiring no domain expertise and the disjoint learning of graph structures and uh, representations. Currently, it has some, uh, some uh, dis disadvantages such as the scalability issue, um, which, is act which is actually also a good future direction uh, in this topic. Now it, become, it comes to the question like, uh, which kind of graph construction approaches we should use? So based on our uh, study and the practice, it's best to use static graph conjunction when we have domain knowledge at hand, which fits the task and it can be represented as a graph. For dynamic graph conjunction, so uh, here might be some uh, reasons why we want to uh, look into that. So this includes uh, um, like lack of domain knowledge, which fits the task or can be represented as a graph or domain knowledge is incomplete or might not contain noise or we want to learn implicit graph, which augments the static graph. So actually we think the last part is the big advantage of static graph conjunction since we can combine the benefits of both the uh, intrinsic static graph and the dynamically learned implicit graph. Okay, so this concludes uh, the graph construction uh, for NLP part. Now let's move to the graph representation learning for NLP part. Uh, let's briefly recap on the uh, DLG for NLP pipelines. So given a graph, uh, we will need to decide which GNs to apply for graph representation learning. So we will try to answer uh, these uh, questions in this, in this part. 
Uh, let's first review some definitions on various types of graphs. So these concepts are important since we will mainly depend on the, depend on the graph types to choose which GNs to apply. So when we have, uh, when the number of node types is one and the, edge, the number of edge type is one, uh, the graph is called the homogeneous graph. And when the number of node types is, is one, but the number of edge types is larger than one, uh, we call it a multi-relational graph. And when, uh, when the number of node types is, uh, uh, is larger than one, we call it a heterogeneous uh, graph. So um, let's first see the overall load map on like which GNs to use given our input graph. So this works like a decision tree, which we summarized to help you make this decision. In short, we will decide whether to apply a homogeneous uh, GNs, uh, multi-relational GNs, or heterogeneous GNs based on the, the input graph types. So uh, when to use the homogeneous GNs, Given a graph, um, if it's a homogeneous uh, graph, uh, according to our definition, we can definitely apply uh, homogeneous GNs. Or uh, if it's not a homogeneous graph, but we can convert it to a homogeneous graph uh, by using some techniques which we'll introduce later, we can also apply homogeneous GNs. And the uh, common homogeneous GNs include the GCN, GAT, graph stage, uh, new, uh, uh, neural networks. Um, in a given uh, non-homogeneous graph, which contains like a various edge types, um, how can we convert it to a homogeneous uh, gra graph? So we can do that by a uh, via Lavi graph co uh, conversion. So Lavi graph conversion, um, like the, the key idea of Lavi graph conversion is basically to regard each edge uh, in the original uh, graph as new nodes and uh, connect the original nodes and the new nodes. So as a result, we will get a bipartite the graph, which is also a, a multi, which is also, uh, which is also a homogeneous graph because now uh, we do not have uh, different edge types because we, uh, we encode the edge types information in the, uh, in, in the nodes in the node attributes. Uh, we know edge direction is very important. Just to think about the success of uh, bi-directional LSTM and the, the BERT models. So given a directed graph, we might not uh, be able to directly apply some homogeneous GNs, uh, which will lead to edge uh, direction information loss. So common strategies for handling uh, directed graphs include uh, one, we just uh, do message passing only allow along like the directed edges, but that will uh, lead to uh, edge direction information loss, which is not ideal. And then two, we can regard edge direction as uh, edge types. And the third, we can apply uh, bi-directional GNs, which are uh, designed for handling uh, directed graphs. Uh, we will introduce each of uh, them uh, next. So, um, so let's first talk about uh, like how we can uh, how we can um, regard edge directions as edge types. So this is actually quite a straightforward. So the idea is that we can add additional reverse edges to the graph. So uh, by doing that, we will have the default. Uh, we will have edges of default type and we will have edges of the reverse inverse type. And uh, we can also add the uh, self loop edges with the edge type uh, self. So then we get a multi relational graph, uh, whereas the edge direction information is captured by the edge type. And we can apply a multi relational graph neural network to encode the directed graph. Mm. So there are also some uh, specially designed graph neural networks for handling uh, directed graphs. And we summarized the two variants of the bi-directional uh, graph neural networks here. The first one is called the BICEP GNN. So BICEP uh, GNN works very similar to the famous uh, bi-directional LSTM model. 
So basically, we can run a uh, multi hop uh, forward GNs on the graph and the multi hop uh, backward GNs on the graph. And at the end, uh, and as the last hop of the GN or last layer of the GN, we just uh, simply concatenated the, the backward node embeddings and the forward node embeddings to get the final node embeddings. So uh, as we can see, like this is kind of similar to how a bi-directional ASTM works. And then the thing, the type of bi-directional GN is called bi-fuse GNs. Um, unlike the, the bi separate GNs where we kind of we kind of fuse the, the backward and the forward uh, node embeddings at the last GN layer. Here in the bifuse GN, we do the uh, fusion at each GN layers. So we run one hop backward uh, forward node aggregation, and then we just fuse the, the backward uh, aggregated vectors and the forward aggregated vectors uh, at each uh, GN layer by using some uh, fuse function. And then we can update the node embeddings with the fused aggregation vectors at each uh, GN layer. Okay, uh, now let's move to the multi-relational GNs. So when to use multi-relational GNs, given a graph, it's not a homogeneous graph and, the, it, and it only contains like one uh, node type. Then uh, based on our definition, it's a multi-relational uh, graph neural network and we can apply multi-relational GNs to encode it. Or if it's a, uh, it's it's a um, not homo. It's a or if it's a, like a directed graph, as we just mentioned, like we can regard the edge directions as edge types, uh, which will uh, result in a multi-relational graph. And then we can also apply multi-relational GNs to encode it. And as for multi-relational GNs, uh, there are several types of uh, GNs. Uh, for encoding multi-relational graphs. One is to include a, a relation specific transformation parameters in GN, which is uh, called like a relational uh, graph neural network. And the, uh, the second one is to introduce edge embeddings in the GNs. And the third one is referred as the multi-relational graph transformers. Uh, let's first take, take a look at, take a look at the, the first type of multi-relational GN, which is called the relational GN or RGN. So the RGN is the, um, is the most common uh, variant, like which works like this. So it has, uh, basically it has two features. One is that it introduces the relation specific transformation. For example, uh, um, here, like we can see uh, date RK. So here R is the, uh, relation type. So uh, that means like for each uh, relation type, we will introduce a specific uh, uh, transformation function to do the node feature transformation. And uh, the second feature of RGN is that we do a node neighborhood aggregation per relation specific uh, subgraph. Uh, for example, like here we have N relations um, or edge types in the in, the, in this multi-relational graph, then we can kind of uh, like decompose the, 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 the graph into, uh, into N subgraphs. And each subgraph is cost, corresponding to a specific uh, uh, edge type. And we can do node neighborhood aggregation per relation specific subgraph. And then we can finally aggregate uh, across all those subgraphs in order to get the final aggregated uh, node embedding. And then we can use the, um, the ag aggregated node embedding to update the target node embedding. This is uh, what is this uh, uh, equation does. Mm, and uh, uh, when we apply the RGN idea to GCN, we, got this, uh, we will get this RGCN uh, model. But we can also apply this idea to other uh, GN variants, for example, the GAT model, then we can get the RGAT uh, variant. So as for the RGCN variant, uh, as we can see here, it, 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 it introduce, introduces the relation specific uh, 
d by d learnable weight matrix uh, to the node aggregation uh, um, operation, and it aggregates the node embeddings per relation specific uh, subgraph R, and then we can aggregate across all the relation specific uh, subgraphs in order to get the final uh, aggregated uh, node, node embeddings. So um, RGN is good at doing like a relation specific message parsing and therefore can handle multi-relational graphs. However, um, it's kind of expensive because we need to learn the D by D transform transformation uh, weight matrix for each relation. And when the number of relation types become very large, which is common in, um, in some NLP applications, for example, uh, in like in knowledge graph related uh, NLP applications. So uh, there are two common ways to uh, to avoid this kind of overparameterization. One is to introduce the basis decomposition, so which regards the relation matrix as a linear combination of shared basis, and this can be seen as a form of weight sharing. Uh, between different relations. The second strategy is the, the block diag uh, diagonal decomposition, which can see as can be seen as a matrix sparsity uh, constraint. So both of the two regularization methods aim to decrease the number of parameters uh, in order to alleviate the overfitting problem. And this the first strategy uh, actually regarded the relation matrix as the linear combination of, uh, um, of the shared basis as we just mentioned. And then the second strategy actually um, imposes on like a matrix sparsity, sparsity uh, constraint. So the second type of uh, multi-relational GN explicitly includes edge embeddings in GNs. So uh, in both variants, here, the EIG, the EIG is an edge embeddings uh, participate into the node aggregation process. Uh, as we already seen from the MPN, the message passing neural network framework. Um, also compared to the variant one, uh, in variant two, we also update the uh, edge embeddings at each GN layer. So, uh, uh, next, let's talk about uh, the third type of uh, multi-relational GN, which is called the multi-relational graph transformers. Um, transformers can be regarded as a special class of GNs where the multi-header self-attention is learning dynamic graph structures adaptively at each layer. Um, and it can jointly learn um, and it can jointly learn and encode a fully connected graph via self-attention. And it, is share, it also share many similarities with, with the, the graph attention network. However, uh, transformer models, uh, especially the vanilla transformer models, uh, fail to effectively handle arbitrary graph structure the data. So uh, multi-relational graph transformers uh, try to combine the benefits of both the trans transformer models and the con conventional graph neural network models uh, by employing the structure aware self attention and, uh, and also uh, respecting variance uh, relation types during the message passing uh, uh, process. So, one such example is called the RGAT based graph transformers. So, um, if we look at this, uh, the, the equation here, um, RGAT based graph transformer introduces this GAT -like, GAT like mask attention. Uh, to the transformer models, um, which respects the, the graph structure of the input data. And also it uh, introduced the relation specific uh, learnable weight matrix here, which is uh, WOK, uh, which respects the edge type information. Um, another type of uh, like multi-relational graph transformer is called the structure aware self-attention based graph transformers. Um, as we can see here, the edge embeddings like participate into both the self-attention computation and the node aggregation process. And it's also, and it, it, it follows the, the overall architecture still like follows the, 
the, the transformer, the classical transformer architecture. Okay, uh, uh, next let's talk about the heterogeneous uh, graph neural networks, uh, which can be used for encoding uh, heterogeneous graphs. So when to use a heterogeneous GNs, uh, given a graph, it's if it's uh, not it's a non-homogeneous graph and, and we don't want to convert it to a homogeneous graph and it has multiple node types uh, based on our definition, uh, the input graph is a heterogeneous graph and we can apply heterogeneous GNs to encode it. And uh, in this tutorial, we will talk about one specific uh, heterogeneous GN, which is called the matter path-based heterogeneous uh, GNs. So, uh, so let's first uh, uh, see an example of a uh, matter path. So uh, given an author and also know the pair, there are at least uh, uh, two matter paths can be extracted from the heterogeneous uh, graph. One is uh, author, paper, topic, paper, author. Uh, the reason is that uh, the author can write a paper, uh, the paper is mentioned by a topic, and the topic is mentioned by another paper uh, written by another author. And we can also uh, extract uh, our second matter path, which is author, paper, venue, paper, author. Uh, by following this, uh, uh, by following this stream. Okay, so uh, based on the matter pass idea, uh, researchers have proposed uh, some matter pass based on heterogeneous genes, and one example is called the HAN model. So it it um, it can be decomposed into like three steps. In the first step, uh, we can do uh, know the type of specific. Uh, uh, know the feature transformations. Here uh, in, in WTVI, so TVI is, is basically the, the node type of the node VI. In the second step, we can do node level aggregation along each matter pass. So here uh, we have this uh, aggregation over neighboring nodes in, in K less matter pass. And then in the third step, we can do matter pass level aggregation. So here we we are uh, we, we we need to compute like attention weights over different matter paths and then do the aggregation. Okay, so that concludes our uh, graph representation learning for NLP part. Now let's uh, continue like moving to the uh, the graph encoder decoder models for NLP part. So um, let's first talk about the the the, uh, the, the classic like encoder decoder architecture. So the encoder decoder architecture is one of the most widely used uh, machine learning framework in the NLP field. So the input encoder maps the input data to a fixed dimension vector, and the output encoder uh, tries to generate the output output data uh, from the the fixed dimension vector. The sequence to sequence model is an encoder, is an end to end encoder decoder framework, uh, which learns to uh, map a variable length input sequence to a variable length output sequence. Uh, common sequence to sequence, sequence variants apply RNN or transformer models as the encoder and the decoder uh, in order to handle the sequential data. Uh, the celebrated uh, sequence-to-sequence -sequence models uh, have achieved a greater success in a wide range of NLP applications, such as uh, neural machine translation, natural language uh, generation, and information extraction. So sequence-to-sequence -sequence models were originally uh, developed to solve sequence-to-sequence -sequence problems, uh, which is to map a sequential input to a sequential output. However, uh, many NLP applications naturally admit graph structure to input the data, such as uh, dependency graphs and AMR graphs. So in comparison with sequential data, graph structure the data is able to encode rich synthetic or semantic relations among objects. Uh, moreover, even if the raw text is originally represented in a sequential form, it can still uh, benefit from explicitly incorporating rich structure information uh, to the sequence. So by nature, uh, sequence-to-sequence models cannot handle graph structured input data. A simple and 
the straight of, uh, uh, straightforward uh, approach is, is to uh, directly uh, linearize the, the structured graph data into a sequential data. And then we can apply the sequence to sequence model to the resulting sequence. However, this kind of uh, linearization approach suffers significant uh, information loss, which will lead to like a downgraded performance. And to address the aforementioned limitations of uh, sequence to sequence models on um, uh, encoding rich and complex graph uh, structured data, uh, in the past few years, a number of graph to sequence models for NLP tasks have been uh, proposed. Uh, these kind of graph to sequence models uh, typically adopt a GN based uh, encoder and, uh, and an RN or transformer based uh, uh, sequential decoder. So compared to the sequence to sequence paradigm, the graph to sequence paradigm is better at capturing the rich structure information of the input uh, uh, data and it can be applied to um, encode arbitrary uh, graph structure the data. Let's take a look at this uh, graph to sequence uh, model. So um, it consists of a graph based encoder, which, uh, which in, employs a, a GN model and, and it contains a, a, a sequence decoder, which imp employs the, like either an RN model or a transformer model. And uh, it also have this uh, the graph pooling part. So once we, we learn the node embeddings from a GN encoder, we need to do some graph pooling in order to do a, in order to get a graph level uh, embedding. And this graph level embeddings can be, you, can be used to initialize the, uh, the, the hidden state of the, of, um, of, the, of the decoder. And uh, just uh, similar to uh, sequence to sequence models, the attention, uh, the attention mechanisms can also be incorporated to the, sequence, to the graph to sequence models very uh, naturally. And the, uh, the key and the key component and the, the key difference of the graph to sequence and the sequence to sequence models is, is, is actually the, the graph encoder part. And uh, so in order to like uh, uh, encode like, in order to handle like directed graphs, uh, we can also apply direct the uh, bidirectional GNs to the uh, graph to sequence paradigm, which gives us the, the bidirectional graph to sequence uh, models. So as we previously mentioned, uh, uh, there are many uh, like different uh, bidirectional GNs, like the bicep GNs and the bifuse GNs. So uh, since we already uh, like uh, introduced these two types of G uh, bidirectional GNs previously, so we will not go to the details here. Okay, um, as we mentioned previously, like we needed to, uh, to get the uh, graph level embeddings from the node level embeddings. So uh, one way is to do some uh, uh, graph pooling, like we can use uh, max pooling, mean pooling or average pooling to get the graph level embedding. And another way uh, to do that is to, to add a, like a one super node, which is connected to all other node, nodes in the graph. Then um, after applying uh, multi-layer graph neural networks, the embeddings of this uh, super node is treated as the graph embedding. So this, uh, this, like, uh, this super node based uh, graph pooling techniques uh, like looks very similar to the, the CLS token in transformer models. Um, but in practice, like we, we found that uh, this strategy is like usually works worse uh, compared to the simple like uh, max mean or average pooling based uh, approaches uh, for getting uh, uh, to, to get the graph level uh, embedding. Uh, this probably because it might introduce some noise to the graph structure. Okay, so uh, let's quickly uh, review the like attention mechanisms used in a graph to sequence uh, paradigm. So this is actually very similar to uh, the the attention mechanism used in a sequence to sequence model. So basically at the decoding stage, we can, uh, we can, we can apply our attention mechanisms to learn to attend to the, 
to the uh, node embeddings and we get the attention weights and then we can do a weighted uh, um we can do a weighted uh, uh combination of the node input and node embeddings in order to get a context vector and we can use the context vector uh and the hidden and the previous hidden state of the decoder to get it to compute the uh, current hidden state of the decoder and we can apply some uh, objective functions, of course, uh, for this uh, graph to sequence uh, learning. Okay, let's see some uh, concrete NLP, uh, NLP applications uh, using the graph, the graph to sequence uh, model. So here uh, we have this uh, baby T19 task, which is basically a pathfinding example. So given a set of sentences, describing the relative geographical positions for a pair of objects. Uh, the goal is to find, the, find a path from a source node and a, to a target node. So we can, uh, we can, uh, we can like naturally uh, convert the, the input text to a graph. Um, and uh, the edge of the, and at the edge of the graph basically describes the, the relative like geographical uh, positions for any pair of nodes. And, uh, um, and this becomes a graph to sequence problem because the input is the graph structured data and the output is the is a path from sequence uh, from, from source node to target node. And, and, uh, and this sequence can be uh, represented as a sequence of nodes. So that's why we can uh, kind of uh, treat this problem as a graph to sequence problem and we can apply a graph to sequence model to solve this problem. And as another task is the short, shortest path finding uh, task, which is also similar, like given a graph and a pair of source and the target nodes, uh, we want to find the short, shortest path from the source node to the target node, which is also a, a graph to sequence problem. So. Uh, compared to the like the ASTM model and other uh, like GCN based uh, uh, models, the graph to sequence models um, outperforms uh, those previous models on um, both of the tasks. And uh, uh, if we if we uh, if we do some uh, evaluation study, we can find that the bidirectional uh, graph neural networks uh, outperforms the the, uh, uh, the, the unidirectional graph neural networks in this task, and it it, it also converges like faster than the uh, than, than the uh, unidirectional uh, graph neural networks. Okay, so uh, when shall we use graph to sequence models? So one such scenario is that the inputs are naturally or better represented in a graph. Uh, for example, uh, in AMR to text uh, uh, task. The input data is original is already a uh, graph structured in graph structured data, so we can apply graph to sequence models. And then the second scenario is that we have a hybrid graph uh, with the raw sequence and uh, also the, uh, the the structure information augmented to the raw sequence. Then uh, we can apply some graph neural networks, uh, the graph to sequence models, to solve the problem instead of uh, applying a sequence to sequence model. So in graph to sequence model, we represented the output as a sequence. Mm, but many NLP tasks, for example, the semantic parsing problem and the mass word problem uh, show on the right side, they also contains like a outputs represented in a complex structure uh, such as a tree. So, mm, so which are which also uh, which also uh, contains like rich structure at the output side. So some in order to handle this kind of graph to tree problems, some graph to tree models are proposed uh, to incorporate the structure information in both the input and output side. Um, and, and if we look at the the left diagram, which is which essentially shows the uh, uh, graph structure input. Um, 
So this can be either like either like a dependency tree augmented text graph or a constitutive tree augmented text graph. And but we can also apply some other like static graph construction approaches to to uh, to represent as the input text to in order to better capture its uh, syntax or semantic relationships. So, and as and as on the right side, we have this uh, tree structure output. Uh, for example, mm. this output uh, math equation can be represented as this uh, tree structure, uh, the data. And uh, this is the a diagram of uh, typical graph to tree models. And as the main difference uh, of this graph to tree model and as a, a graph to sequence model is on the decoder side. So here we have a, a tree, have a tree decoder. And if we take a deeper look into this tree decoder, um, like there could be different tree decoders, but uh, in summary, there are two types of tree decoders. One is based on the uh, the depth first search, and the other is depends is other depends on uh, it's based on the breadth first uh, search. And uh, mm, yeah, so in this paper, the authors also proposed uh, to use separate attentions because we have different node types in the input graph. Like we have this in the uh, in the mm, constituency tree augmented text graph, we have this. Uh, word and nodes and, uh, and there's other like functional words. So we can also propose to use separate attention uh, in this uh, graph to tree model. And uh, the experimental results showed that uh, the proposed graph to tree models uh, significantly outperforms the previous sequence to sequence model and the graph to sequence models. And also uh, the, and also outperforms the Bridge methods, which depends on some um, task specific tricks like the equation normalization. Okay, so here we have some visualizations of the separated attentions. So we can see that uh, different attention types, uh, like this attention for wooden nodes and the attention for structure nodes. So different attention types focus on attending to like different node types. Okay, so this uh, concludes uh, our like uh, the DLG for NLP uh, foundations part. So we will have a 10 minutes of break. So, so after the break, we will um, have uh, Hen, uh, Yunya and Bang to talk about some uh, applications of GNs in, in different NLP tasks. And we will have a demo session to showcase uh, our uh, graph graph for NLP library. And then we will uh, mention some um, future directions in this DLG for NLP field. So if you want to uh, prepare for the demo session, you can follow the instructions here to install the, the library. Yeah, uh, thanks everyone. Let's take a 10 minutes break here. Hello everyone. I'm Hunti from UAC. I would like to start the first application um, on information ingestion. So uh, we would like to start from IE because it's a very natural task that requires graph encoding and graph decoding. So I will talk about how to use the algorithms you have learned so far for improving the quality and also portability and also extend the scope of research problems to some new applications. Um, so this presentation has to be has been very, very uh, quiet. <laughs> so please do ask questions. Um, I woke up very early today, hopefully. <laughs> um, it's worth your time and my time. Um, I'm also going to show a live demo for a few minutes and also um, have some quiz. So hopefully it will be more exciting. Um, so what is the IE task? Uh, so IE is about a sequenced graph task. So basically we take natural language questions. Sorry, I'm just trying to see whether anyone is asking me questions on chat. Uh, yeah, so you can also um, leave me questions on the chat if you don't want to speak up, but I prefer everyone to speak up. So let's have some introductions. Uh, so IE is about a sequenced graph 
uh, decoding, you take a natural language uh, sequence as the input. It can be a graph um, in the nature because all these words might be involved in a semantic parsing graph. And then you can decode a knowledge graph out of it. So in this knowledge graph, each node is an entity or event trigger. Uh, so trigger means a word that indicates the event. And then you can also construct the edges among these nodes. So the output is basically a graph. So the traditional work using um, neural networks is trying to look at this as a sequence graph. So encode a sequence and decode a graph. So the challenge here is that sometimes the um, word of indicating the event and the entity might be far away from each other, or maybe two entities are far away from each other in the sentence for a sequence to sequence problem. So um, we can take advantage of the existing graph construction from semantic parsing of just looking at a transformer graph. And then we can take advantage of the graph structure for better encoding. On the other hand, in the decoding part, maybe instead of left to right beam search, we can also try to consider this as a graph decoding problem. So basically for every trigger and every entity you already identified, you can look at the certain branches or neighbors in that graph and try to decide which other entities should be involved in the event or relation. So this is one work they construct a graph based on just a very simple span graph. So basically try to look at uh, the input as a graph convolutional network so that you can have these neighbors in a graph instead of the original sentence. And this is another paper um, we did uh, last year at the NACO. So we try to construct a graph based on semantic parsing so that you can also compress the wider content in the way in the encoding. And then in the decoding, we will look at the branches. For example, when we already identified the trigger murder, we can look at all these other nodes um, under this branch so that you can narrow down the scope of decoding. So basically we will look at this as a graph encoding and graph decoding problem in the input we'll convert the sequence into a semantic parsing graph. And then in the decoding, we'll look at the, uh, all these entities under the branch of this uh, governing node called trigger word. And then we'll look for the participants involved in the event. The other advantage we can take is the uh, heterogeneous uh, graph in the semantic parsing output. So usually all of them can give you some really nice uh, heterogeneous types of edges. So we can use the graph attention network that you has already described. Uh, especially we can use the edge conditional GAT so that we can use the um, um, semantic parsing edge type information um, for better encoding. And in the decoding, uh, the procedure is very similar to what we normally do uh, in Bing search, but instead of left to right, we are doing this in a top-down manner. So basically we are going to look at the each candidate node that indicates event type. And then we go from that node and look down until we reach the leaf node of the entities. So why this is good? Because in this way, we can ignore the very wide contact in, the, in some sentences. For example, between here airlifting and Washington, um, it's not very clear from the input sequence that uh, this Washington is a location participant of this uh, event. But uh, in this um, semantic parsing graph, we can see they are neighbors in the graph. So our model using graph encoding was able to identify this Washington as a candidate, as a participant. So that's about how we can use uh, graph algorithms that we have described for improving the quality of ingestion. And uh, we can also use it, this to extend the scope uh, and improve the portability of IE. So uh, in a traditional way, in the NLP community, we only look at the uh, text side of the news articles when we do IE. So basically we assume that all the information is contained in the text part, but that's not always true. What we found was that 34% of the information is actually included in images and videos. So, 
we should uh, really look into the multimedia fusion, multimedia information ingestion. But the problem is there's very little annotation or resource available for images and videos. So here we can, again, use the graph structure, try to map different data modalities into a common semantic space. So we are going to do similar work on the image and video side. We'll run semantic passing and construct a graph, semantic graph, so that we can map that semantic graph in, and uh, another semantic graph from the captions into one common semantic space. So you can think of this as two languages and they are sharing one common semantic space. And we are also taking advantage of the structures so for example, here you can see this object is likely to be the agent of this event. Um, and sometimes because of the limitation of object detection, we can also use attention-based graph. So basically this heat map indicates this is as agent. And then this agent, this label serve as bridge to connect the uh, image and the video and the text all together. So for example, here, this agent is more likely to be aligned with arc zero in the semantic graph from the text side. So that means we can just use one representation for multiple data modalities. The cool thing here is that once we have this common semantic structure space, we can then connect image and the text using the, these structures. And the greatest thing about text is that we not only have training data, we also have rich definition, a natural definition of what we are looking for. So for example, we want to look at a event type of movement transportation, and we already know what is usually appeared as agent or entity or instrument in this event type, then if we can somehow convert the input image into a structure, then we can naturally map that structure with this event uh, uh, type definition, so we can do information gestion in a zero shot or few shot way. So um, to better describe this event type, we propose to use conscious of learning so that it can disambiguate different similar types for uh, very similar images. So in addition to the template that's usually uh, part of the definition, we will also construct some negative description of the event by replacing some arguments with other arguments randomly so that we can have both positive description and negative description for this event type. So these are some possible ways we can construct the prompt. We can simply look at the templates. We can also compose them together into more complicated prompt, or we can use embedding representation to make the prompt continuous. And then we can also look into the uh, uh, GPT-3 language models to make the prompt uh, or the templates richer um, so that we can compare that with the different variants of the image representation. So using this, we can then also generate some negative descriptions. For example, using GP3, we can simply uh, replace some argument and then generate a new template to represent the negative representations of the type. So by doing this kind of zero shot, few shot uh, framework, we can identify a lot of really nice events. And uh, I mean, not nice in the <laughs> sentiment sense, but uh, very good quality. So, so for example, on the left, if you only look at the images, um, if the system does not have a really good way to identify emotions, it, it will mistakenly identify this one as a protest. But um, the text side clearly says this is a very happy play. It's not a uh, protest. On the uh, right side, we can see that if we ignore the image, and uh, if we only look at text, search is not a very common word to indicate arrest. We might miss this event. But uh, combining the multimedia structure information, we can identify this as the arrest event. Compared to other multimodal flat representations, such as clip, we can identify some detailed semantic roles. For example, in this image, if you don't look at the structure information, this person might be mistakenly identified as agent, but uh, using our structure representation, we can identify this as a person who is being arrested. Similarly, on the right side, a lot of the union boxes, uh, bounty box like this that uh, includes a crowd of people, it's very difficult to be identified as a uh, correct role if you don't use a structure. 
But uh, looking at the structure, we can clearly see the spatial relation between this bounding box and the truck so that we can identify this as a man um, uh, artifact uh, that's being trans transported to another place. So that's about portability. And we can also use this to um, uh, define some interesting new literature problems. So one problem we have been looking at is about schema induction. The reason we need a schema is because usually sequence to sequence is only limited to sentence level. And uh, sometimes we really need global background knowledge to do better IE. So what is a schema? Schema is usually indicating the patterns that show how events evolve over time and how events are organized in a hierarchical structure. So for example, here shows a schema for civil unrest. Under this uh, note, you can see three chapters, coup, international intervention, and the ceasefire. And under each chapter, you can also see the events, how they are connected. So normally we create or construct a schema manually, but uh, many created schemas don't have any probabilities and you cannot do a very reliable prediction. So we propose to use deep learning from graphs algorithms for schema induction. Basically, we can consider the connections between two events as a graph. For example, between a learning and a, a injury event, you can see all these other events in between to show how they're connected. So this is about IED's uh, schema. So the first someone assembled a bomb and then it was moved to a place, a pack, and someone got injured and some people died. And uh, finally, um, this person might be arrested. So um, to use the graph, uh, algorithms, we can naturally think of this as a graph generation problem. So we are going to start from some seed nodes, which we already observed from the data. So for example, we already know there's a tag happened, there's a guy happened, and then we can predict what will be the next node that should appear after these two events. So um, we predict the event node, and then we further predict what should be the connection between these two nodes, between the new node and old node. So the connections can be represented by argument rows or the relations between two entities or their temporal relation. So why this is good? Because once we have the schema, then we can match the schema with a new instance. So suppose this is uh, today's news, then we can match this instance graph with a schema graph. And then from here, we can then determine which nodes are missing, which are in the schema graph, but are not in the instance graph. So that event might happen tomorrow. So um, to do the event um, uh, node matching, we use a integer programming, consider this as an integer programming problem. So basically we are going to check whether this missing node is strongly connected to the match nodes by looking at whether their neighbors match, whether the path connecting the new node and all the older nodes is short enough or is, uh, the distance is near enough. So um, by combining these two metrics in the graph neural network, we can then look into the subgraph and then use uh, message parsing to determine how likely this new node should be predicted. So uh, the cool thing about this is it, because it, the schema is automatically induced from the graph generation model, so we can actually pr produce a multiple hypothesis with some confidence value. So this is beyond a human could do because human usually only can predict the most common event nodes. So comparing the results, for example, from here, human uh, mistakenly predicted all these events which won't happen yet. So for example, child hearing and a sentence won't happen yet because this person is not arrested yet. But a graph model can successfully identify their, um, these in, in, um, immediate um, events that will happen right after this. And uh, we also give very nice uh, ranking and the probabilities of these predicted events. So if you look at the accuracy, uh, we can actually get much better performance uh, compared to human constructed um, schema. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about a few applications, um, especially when we are applying this to downstream NLP um, tasks. So the first application we can look into is cross document summarization. Um, so when the news articles involving a complex event, you usually see there's a timeline 
And uh, usually it's really time consuming to construct this kind of timeline manually, but uh, we can use the graph models to do this automatically. So the basic idea is that we use the IE techniques that we described before to construct a big graph from all the input documents about the same complex event. And then we can um, encode this using graph neural network, and then we can use um, graph transport algorithms to compute distance between the selected nodes and the original graph so that we make sure that we pick the smallest graph and this graph preserve enough information or meaning compared to the original graph. So we can think of this as a graph compression problem. So usually when people do sentence simplification, they consider this as a sentence compression problem. So instead of compressing the sentence, we are compressing the whole bigger graph. And then we can use this small graph as our input you can use conditional generation or simply pick the sentences that cover this most important subgraph and then generate the final summary. Another application is that we can use this for question answering. So usually when we do um, multimedia question answering, we uh, usually you know, search for the answers in different data modalities separately. But now since we have this nice multimedia graph, we can then match that multimedia knowledge graph with the gra little graph, small graph constructed from the question. And then we can consider this as a graph matching problem and then return the answer. So um, the final application I would really like to mention is about fake news detection. So the reason we are uh, uh, talking about this is because not only um, it can use the graph algorithms I already described, but also um, it's a very important application right now because um, we are facing a information pollution problem. Every day we see so much misinformation going on. So um, for those of you who may have already um, heard a similar talk from myself. Uh, all these examples are new, so you can still take a look. Uh, so what I would like to ask everyone to check is between these two documents, which one do you think is, is fake? You can speak up or type your uh, answer in the chat. Uh, so the different parts are highlighted in the red. Um, so these two are basically about the same entity, this uh, Galloway, and uh, so basically he was saying something or he was making another claim, but uh, the claims are different. So I guess if you're not uh, following US news and if you have no idea who this person is, maybe it's extremely hard to figure out which one, um, which one is fake, which one is real. If I have to make a guess, maybe I will guess the, maybe the right one because simply because this one is shorter, right? So um, yeah, so sometimes you can just simply check some service information like that without enough background knowledge. However, if you look at another example like this one, um, so basically, uh, again, it's talking about the same event, but now uh, it's actually mentioning different people, different entities involved in the event and different locations and uh, different issues. So uh, it's about uh, companies, um, um, financial analysis, basically. So if you never pay attention to what this company is doing or never read their financial report, it's almost impossible to figure out which one is real or which one is fake. And again, here, the different parts are almost with the equal lens. So it's impossible to make a guess. Uh, on the right side, the, this one is fake uh, because this person never said this uh, claim. Again, right, so if you, don't know this person, didn't read the written news, it's impossible to tell. Um, but uh, um, sometimes if you look at the multimedia um, information, maybe you can get more clues. So for example, here's another image and uh, there are two captions, so one of them is fake. So the difference here between real and fake is that the location is different. One says this one is Australia and also the event, like why these people are gathering here are different. So one says, um, it's about um, oil, the other one talking about power plant. Um, so if you look at this image, can anyone tell which one's fake? Especially I know most, many of you are from Europe, so <laughs> you probably can tell from the, some information in the image, like this spelling of the place. Any clues? Wow, this is much more quiet than my class. It's a little depressing. <laughs> okay, uh, so the, the fake caption is on the left side. So um, you can see this is uh, likely to be written in German, 
but not in English. So you can use that as um, information. And also maybe if you know the logo by any chance, uh, then you can guess this is about power, power plant. Okay, so the idea is that uh, in most cases, the fake news is not like 100% fake. Usually only a small portion of the document is fake. And uh, we always need to look into the knowledge element level rather than sentence level to be able to tell which one is true, which one is fake. So our idea is to construct a multimedia knowledge graph like I already described in the previous algorithms and then look into the, each triple in this multimedia knowledge graph to see whether it's real or fake. Um, so in this way, if a triple is inconsistent with the other triples in the knowledge graph, then we can say that one is likely to indicate a fake information. So for example, here, uh, this place is hidden in the corner, right? So that's a real information, but that information is inconsistent with the information saying the police was shooting at the protesters in the caption. So here clearly one of them is fake. So we can use the inconsistent checking across different data modalities from this graph and then use graph encoder uh, to represent the inconsistency or consistency across the whole graph. So to construct this graph, in addition to the techniques I have already said, uh, we also needed to do cross media reference resolution. So we need to figure out this place mentioned in the body text is the same as this bounding box in the image and uh, this shooting event in the uh, body text is the same as the shooting in this uh, caption so that we can construct this graph across different data modalities. And then we can do message passing within each data modality and then cross data modality to determine which triple chip, is consistent or inconsistent with other triples. So one big challenge here is that we simply don't have any training data because usually human written fake news, although they are you know, really harming the society, but usually they will be removed immediately or maybe one day later after they are posted. So it's a very difficult to collect large amount of training data to train our detector. So we have to propose a more innovative solution, which is to generate condition, not graph condition fake news automatically and use that for training. I just want to make a big disclaimer here. We're not going to share the generator. We're not going to share any techniques about how we actually generate fake news. So um, we are only sharing our detector, but the training data is necessary to train our detector. Um, so again, because we, we have this knowledge graph, we can use it as a nice control. So we, for example, we can manipulate this graph. So we only uh, change some knowledge elements, for example, locations or entities involved, or maybe the events involved. So um, we can manipulate the knowledge graph by switching the entities, or maybe simply add a new relation or event, or maybe simply replace a subgraph with another fake subgraph so that we can have a fake knowledge graph. And then from this fake, partially fake knowledge graph, we can then use conditional natural language generation to generate a new article for our training. Um, but the tricky thing is, because we involve multiple data modalities, if the manipulated knowledge elements are not grounded in the image, then it's likely to be a good training data because it's going to mislead the model um, and also I mean, mislead the detector, then it's very good training data. Um, but sometimes if the knowledge element, for example, bicycle is already grounded in the image, we probably should not touch it because if you change bicycle with a truck, for example, then the model can immediately detect this inconsistency. So this training data is too easy, right? So we decided to look at uh, cross-media grounding results. Sorry, give me a second. My cats are on my desk. Sorry about that. I'm really sorry about that. Yeah, just need to remove them so that, that I won't be distracted. Um, so after we um, do the cross-media grounding checking, we are going to uh, avoid the knowledge elements which appear in the images. So we will manipulate things like SAMP here and replace that with another uh, country name, Fiji, because these two entities are similar and also um, Fiji and Zambia are not grounded in the image. 
So um, using semantic parsing, we can also consider another graph so that we can have other more fine-grained relation types. And we can also manipulate this relation type by uh, switching the rows or changing some events into uh, negated events. And then uh, again, use graph to text generation to generate a uh, fake document. So how good is this kind of generation conditioned by the graph? We did a tuning test by showing the pairs of the original real document, the fake document, just like what I did in the quiz. Uh, so human is only able to identify about 42% of the fake documents, which is good news because that means uh, the detector we trained from this kind of automatic generated training data could be very robust. So we apply this to detect um, two data sets, um, uh, fake documents, and uh, we can see our model compared to the previous work, which did not use a uh, graph, we can achieve much better performance and um, um, on both levels, document level and not element level. And this is just showing another quick example. Um, so this, facility called the Twin Towers is not showing in the image and uh, the previous work uh, detectors fail to identify this as misinformation, but our um, fine-grained notch element level detector can identify this. So going to use the remaining two minutes to show a quick demo. This demo is new. It's going to appear at this year's ACL and I don't think I ever show this. So hopefully it will be interesting. So um, basically combining the uh, multimedia, multilingual knowledge graph results, we, and also the fake news um, detection, we can then construct a system, what we call as clean radar. So the clean radar are basically looking at all the claims related to one topic. So for example, about COVID-19, we can look into these different topics, and then you can search in terms of claimer, affiliation, of the claimer and um, and also um, the object mentioned in the claim and the location of this claim. So, for example, I want to look at I don't know what 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 health organization. Then it will return all these claims, um, showing you that who uh, said something. So this one is about um, you know a lot of them uh, is about the origin of the virus. Um, so what might have caused the, the virus. And then you can see the source. If you don't trust this claim, sorry, why this not founding? Okay, this one. <laughs> um, and uh, also you can see the claimers, we link the claimer to the to Wikidata. So you can see um, who are the claimers. And then you can also click here um, to see more details. So you can see um, the object is mentioned and also the associated knowledge graph. So if you click each of these events, you can see uh, what other entities are involved in this event. Uh, so for example, this one that has place argument and uh, all these entities are associated with this um, claim. Um, and then we can also consider the claim graph because some other claims might be equivalent or they are supporting or they are refuting uh, of the, uh, compared to the claim you are looking at. Okay, so that's um, one um, demo. Uh, and uh, we also include um, multiple languages. So this one we include um, English, Spanish, and uh, Russian. Um, yeah, so you can see here, this one from Russian news. Uh, we already translated the results, so you probably can not tell it's from Russian, but the language here indicates it's Russian, so it's from this. Um, Russian news articles. Yeah, okay. So that's one um, demo. And the other demo uh, just want to really quickly uh, show is that you can do event recommendation use the um, multimedia knowledge graph we constructed. So this one, you can search for different type of attack, attackers, um, you know, like you can search for anyone, anything related to this person. So uh, this, is about uh, what's going on in this place. And it, on the right side, you can see all the related events um, related to, to this. Um, yeah, so you can see the event is populated from multimedia and the, the entities here is uh, linked to the uh, text side. 
And then you can also show this on the map. So for example, if we have all these events identified from 300 languages, you can then look at into this map to see what's going on. So here, different icon show, uh, indicates different event type. And um, you can also see the source content. Sometimes we can translate it, sometimes we cannot, but that's okay because we can do cross-lingual uh, interlinking. So at least you know where this um, event is. So this can help a analyst who does not understand the original language to see what's going on and will be very useful for applications like disaster management. Okay, that's all, thank you. Um, and if you have any questions, you can ask me now or just leave the question in the chat. Thank you. Okay. Yin Yang, please take over. Yes. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Um, Not yet. We're looking at your desktop background. Um, a second. Mm -hmm. I always have some challenge. Uh... Okay, let me try again. Um, so you don't see my screen, right? How about now? Do you see it? Yes, yes. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, it says I'm screen sharing. You don't see anything? You can see your screen, yeah. Oh, you can see it? Yeah. Okay, good. Is it presentation mode, right? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Then let's get started. Okay, so um, just to continue to talk about applications of the graph neural network in natural language processing, the next topic we're going to talk about is machine reading comprehension. So first, uh, briefly talk about the task itself. So reading, uh, machine reading comprehension is a task of giving a question in natural language based on unstructured data or semi-structured data, extract an answer or select a correct answer from a given list. So one particular challenge type of task in reading comprehension is Mandelhub reading comprehension, where the answer can only be obtained based on reasoning across multiple resources. Um, one popular data set for this task is the Wikihub for this data set the input is a question in the form of source entity relation unknown answer entity, along with a short list of candidate entity. Then based on Wikipedia and Wikidata, a reading comprehension uh, system then select the correct candidate entity from the given list. So I'm gonna talk about a few work that I attempt to use the graph uh, graph neural network to solve the problem. So the first one is this paper published uh, a few years back in TACO. So what this paper does is it leverage a graph neural network by constructing entity graph based on mentions from all supporting documents and then connect uh, the entities using different age types and relationships. So here are the different types mentioned. So as you can see, there are basically uh, four kinds of edges, although only three are shown here. One is the document-based, where if the entities co-occur in the same document, then there is an edge in between them. And then there is another one is based on exact match. If the entities are exact match of each other, there is a dotted uh, line edge. And then finally, based on some co-reference model, identify co-reference resolution, co-ref relationship. Then for any nodes that are not connected, otherwise are also complement uh, edge that is uh, also added, although not shown in this graph itself. So based on what we have, using the terminology we described before, right? Uh, as you can see, the graph itself is a heterogeneous uh, graph. 
it has multiple node type and uh, it it has only actually one entity node type here, um, but it's a multiple different relations. So therefore, um, the graph is constructed uh, using uh, it is captured by entity relational graph convolutional network. So the candidate uh, scoring is using the final node embedding and the question representation to predict a distribution over a candidate. So this is a formula used uh, uh, in the computation. And then let's look at the final experimental results. So we can make a few interesting observations here. So the first thing is that if we replace the ALMA embedding by glove embedding, as you can see, it still yield a competitive system, which means that the graph neural network itself is quite useful uh, in addition to the embedding. The second is if we if the authors get rid of the relation type, uh, the relation, and you can see there is a small drop, um, but still it indicates that the relation types are important. Uh, and then when the authors get rid of different kind of edges, as you can see, the one that um, uh, the, the biggest drop is resulting by dropping the edges using document-based relation. So this is not very surprising because majority of the connection between nodes are indeed between mentions within the same document. And also without connecting mentions within the same document, uh, basically, we are removing important information since the model is not able to aware whether the nodes occur closing in the document as well. Uh, and finally, you know, other types are not so important, uh, but they still have some in, impact. And finally, uh, if you remember, and also you can you can look at the paper itself. Also, there is a heuristic used to, to assign edge and labels. Right. But instead of doing this uh, heuristic based assignment, uh, these authors also try to replace them using a model component to predict the edges. And as you can see, when replace the edges constructed using heuristics, using the model introduced uh, edges, there is a huge job. This means that learning to predict edge is a very hard problem. So it's still I open problem. As you can see, quite a uh, number of work we're gonna talk about are still using heuristic-based approach. Um, then the authors also look into scalability problem. Uh, as you can see, the performance gradually decrease as number of candidate answer or number of nodes increase as both need to larger and more complex graphs. And we're gonna see this in later work as well. Um, then, as, you, as we just mentioned, right, in the paper we just described, the only entity level information taken into account when it comes to graph construction. Uh, so they work by two at all, seeks to take information from additional granularity into consideration. So look into the queries and the, the document and the entity themselves. So it first generates a query aware candidate and document mention vector representation with core attention and self attention. So core attention here enables the model to consider core dependency between query and document, query and candidate, and candidate and mention. While the self uh, attention summarize the information present in the core attention output by, by calculating a score for each word in the sequence. So as we can see, the heterogeneous document entity graph contains the three kind of node, document node, candidate node, and entity node. Uh, and uh, with this three kind of node, it also introduced additional type of edges, uh, mostly based on core occurrence. So the document and candidate document and entity, candidate and entity, uh, and then between entities, the um, edges similar to what we have described before, whether they're from the same document or whether they are exact mention of the same candidate or query subject from different document. And, and then any kind of pair of entities without aforementioned um, relationship, there is the edges added here too. 
So the graph become much more complex and uh, much more granular. Um, and then all the contractual embedding I initialized in the graph, I gated the GCN used to train the node representation in the graph. So this is um, similar to what we have seen before. This is the heterogeneous graph, but it has more than one uh, node type, but it's uh, then uh, it's used a different kind of graph embedding to capture the graph information. Um, the final node representation of candidate and entity nodes corresponding to mentions of candidate are used to calculate classification scores. And then we we'll look at uh, the impact of different element of graph on the final results. Uh, we can see that the first for the heterogeneous uh, document entity graph is quite important. Um, if, if we just keep that, it's already giving pretty high number. Um, but if we re remove the edge type, we can see some uh, drop here. So that means the edge types are important. Uh, and then if we remove the entity node scores and or, or the edge type or node scores, you can see the removal of entity node scores are, uh, has the most influence, which is not surprising because entities tend to have more important information uh, for question answering. And then finally, if we remove different kind of node, as we can see again, uh, the drop is the biggest when we remove entity node uh, because those are the most important. This is why like the previous work essentially is only looking to entity node, but it still get a pretty high number. However, you know, by adding additional information at the uh, Granular, other granularity, we can see this newer work um, resulting in better results. Uh, and we can also see in terms of scalability, um, the performance decrease based on the number of a document or candidate, uh, number of candidate increase. So essentially the more, the, the larger the graph is, the more complex our graph is, uh, the performance will decrease. So this is one challenge um, facing you know, graph neural network. How do we scale with larger and more complex graph? Um, so there's also another work that um, looking into more details of the semantic structure of the sentence and then learn cross paragraph reasoning part and find supporting facts and answers jointly. So the previous work only look at uh, you know, the entity level or at the document level. So here you look at the final ground analysis, look at the uh, relationships across sentences within or you know, across different document. So it's again, it's a heterogeneous document level graph, but it has the additional no type of sentence. Um, and then the sentence the row labeling subgraph are constructed per sentence. So each sentence may construct a multiple subgraph. So the argument from the semantic row labeling uh, are used as a node and the predicates are used as edges. So you can see an example of such a heterogeneous SRL graph. So as we can see um, here, basically we have different level, right? So we can have uh, like argument node and we have a document level node and then the subgraphs per sentence are captured within the orange box. And we can also see the edges across uh, um, the, the predicate edges uh, between the predicate and the argument and then um, edges uh, connecting sentence node and argument node and connecting sentence with shared argument. So essentially it gave it uh, a bit more um, semantics for node in between the argument node. So a lot of the argument node will, will correspond to entity node. So as you can see, uh, this particular approach results in better number. So we can see the compared to previous work, SRL graph significantly improves the completeness of the graph network. Uh, that is providing sufficient uh, semantic edge to cover reading path. So if, if we think about uh, the work we described earlier, right? So the 
the connection between entities are mostly based on uh, either exact match or based on the uh, co-reference resolution. So SRL graph provide additional um, ways to connect uh, information across different places in the document. So you can see some uh, important uh, improvement here. Uh, and also we can see if we remove SRL graph, there is a significant drop which indicating SRL graph is very important. Um, and also if we get rid of the type of information or predicate edges, we can also see import, a, a significant drop. So which uh, I can um, indicate that important because they are really fundamental to the chain of reasoning when come to multi hub reading comprehension. So the, main, the authors also look into main resources of errors. Uh, so one is uh, based on uh, synonym, um, because synonyms are very important to connect uh, argument across different sentences with each other. So this is one way of how the edges are constructed. And we can also see other cases of uh, impact of errors, mostly based on edges of how edges are constructed. So similar to synonym, we also have uh, uh, multiling, you know, the linguistic variants, and then how months and some some uh, uh, edges are missing, like due to miss of uh, synonyms or understanding of variants. Others are uh, edges constructed added because uh, they did not handle the month year correspondence well. So overall, it shows that. The um, using SR information very helpful, but we still have quite a bit of work to do in terms of how do we improve the quality of edges across the uh, node, across the um, SRL subgraph. So another interesting talk uh, work I want to introduce is this textbook question answering. So unlike the work we just seen before, Question, you know, textbook question answering has a few interesting challenges. Uh, first of all, uh, the textbook, right, as we can see, mostly contains both the visual content as well as the textual content. So it requires to solve multimodal question answering problem. And also, even the format of the question, it can contain both text related or diagram related questions. So it has its own unique challenges. So we, as we mentioned, right, the multimodality problem, and then also textbook tend to be much longer than average uh, document. Um, so it has very long context. And also typically, you know, every text document talk about one particular kind of a domain, right? So what do you learn from one domain, for example, biology may be hard to apply to solve problems in other domains such as English. Uh, so it's really difficult to solve unseen problem. So this work introduced a few interesting techniques to address all these key challenges. Um, so the first thing is, uh, so it, it has a few different steps. So the first step is preparation step. The preparation step is to, um, ident to identify the case answer among N candidates. So the context M is determined by TF IDF score with the question and the case answer, then the context M is converted into a context graph M. The question and the case answer are also embedded by glove and the character embedding. So this step is repeated for all candidates. Then the second step, embedding step using RNC as a sequence embedding module and FGNC as a graph embedding module. With our tension method, the authors can obtain combined features. Uh, and after concatenation, RN and a fully connected uh, module predict final distribution in the solving step. Um, so this is a heterogeneous graph and it's undirected. Uh, the textbook questions are very domain specific and it's very difficult to use training data to help predict unseen questions. So this work also introduced a self-training step that helps the model learn to read and understand a textbook and the problems in advance without the help of by a teacher. So essentially, it's also uh, using unsupervised approach, looking into the um, 
text used in the test. So it's so this way you can learn something in advance. So it's very similar to you know how students right before the exam you can read the textbooks, um, but without actually knowing all these questions. Um, so as we can see here, um, doing self training, even owning over the training data is helpful and over the test data is even more helpful. And, and then the context graph is very effective. Uh, the final work I'm going to talk about in machine comprehension is uh, conversational machine comprehension. So the machine comprehension problem we just talked about is kind of have a document, then have a question, then you answer that particular question. Conversational machine comprehension task is more complex. It's answer question is a conversation. So giving a passage and previous uh, question answer pairs, depending on the context of previously asked the question and answer, um, provide an answer accordingly. So the challenge is the, there is the shift of uh, uh, focus. And also we need to maintain uh, the core reference or ellipsis uh, information. So a lot of time, if you think about it, right, in typical machine comprehension, every question is self-contained, but in conversational machine comprehension, it has core ref or ellipsis of two previous questions. So each of the question is not necessarily complete on its own. So you need to, uh, in order to pre properly understand a question, you need to leverage the conversational history. Uh, so this is architecture of the uh, framework proposed by the author. It consists of an encoding layer, reasoning layer, and a prediction layer. For encoding layer, it used by by our STM to encode a question and another one to encode context for each uh, conversation turn. Uh, the main technical contribution is in the reasoning layer. So it has the context graph learning component that dynamically construct a question and the conversation history aware context graph at each turn to model semantic relationship among context words. Uh, and then it has another context graph reasoning component using a novel RGN and module to model a sequence of context graph in a conversation, which we will explain shortly in next slides. And finally, the prediction layer, uh, which predicts answer location by matching question and context embedding. Um, so, this work has, uh, so we talk about this context graph, right? So, so in this particular work, the interesting context graph structure is unknown. Moreover, it may vary across different terms because there is a change of question and then depending on how questions refer to previous uh, um, question and uh, answers. So this work use a dynamic, um, uh, Neural graph neural network. So it dynamically build a question and the conversation history are where context graph to model semantic relationship among context words at each turn. Uh, so when performing reasoning over context, context is viewed as graph of words that capture rich semantic relationship among words and then apply RGNN to produce a, to process a sequence of context graph. So this module combines the advantage of RN, which are good at the sequence learning, and GNN, which are good at the relational reasoning. So, um, so we talk about the challenge of conversational uh, machine comprehension. So the focus of the question can change over time. So, and this can be actually easily visualized by uh, visualizing the changes of um, hidden representation of context words between consequentive uh, terms by computing the cosine similarity of hidden representation of the same context words at uh, uh, each turn. And then we can highlight the words that have the smaller cosine similarity scores. So you can see from this figure, it highlighted the most changing context words between um, consecutive uh, turn in a conversation in this dev set. So as we can see, the, 
the hidden representations of context words which are relevant to the questions are changing most and thus highlighted the most. Uh, so we suspect this is partially because when the focus shift, the model found out that the context to chunk relevant to previous term become less important, but those relevant to the current term become more important. Um, so in summary, in machine reading comprehension, graph neural network enables multi-hub reasoning and it allows the, the encoding of heterogeneous information in a very uh, natural and intuitive way. So the next topic I'm going to talk about is the natural language generation. So the task of natural language question generation uh, is to generate a natural language question from a passage and an answer. So ideally, the general questions are supposed to be relevant to the given passage and the answer. Uh, and this has many useful applications, such as providing training data for QA systems. Um, so this uh, I, ICRR 2020 paper um, proposed I IL-based the graph to sequence model for the question generation task. As we can see from this diagram, the model consists of a GNA-based graph to sequence generator and a hybrid evaluator combining both cross-entropy-based and um, uh, IL-based objective functions. In order to better capture the rich structure information hiding in the passage text, they construct a passage graph which contains each word in the passage as a node and then apply GNN to encode the graph. So as you can imagine, you know, this is a place where additional improvement could be potentially may, be made, you know, construct more complex graphs. Um, and as for graph constructing, the authors explore two different strategies. The first strategy is the uh, syntax-based uh, static uh, passage graph construction, similar to what we discussed before, where they uh, use a dependency graph to, um, to do the graph construction. And second part is do a semantic aware dynamic passage graph construction, uh, where the node embedding is built based on similarity metrics learning and KN style specification. Because the construct graph is a direct graph, the authors apply bidirectional GNN to encode the graph. Specifically, they introduce a bifused GGNN as a graph encoder. So the experimental result shows a few interesting things. First of all, um, the static graph construction perform slightly better compared to only use the dynamic uh, graph. Um, but or, and then the bidirectional GM performs better. And then finally, the graph to sequence performs better than sequence to sequence because the graph to sequence captures more um, complex information. Uh, the second task I'm going to talk about on natural language generation is code summarization. So, intuitively, the task is that giving a piece of code. Uh, output a natural language sentence that describes the code. So you can imagine this kind of work can be, be very useful in automatic uh, uh, documentation generation or comments uh, generation. So this paper um, also applies GNN based graph to sequence framework for the code uh, summarization task, which aim to generate a natural language sentence to summarize the code. As for graph construction, they propose to combine the static uh, CPG graph and the attention-based dynamic graph. Uh, as for the dynamic graph, they apply structure-based similarity metrics learning, which uh, utilize the edge information of the static graph. They also combine the intrinsic uh, static graph and the learned implicit graph for better performance. Uh, as for graph representation learning, uh, because the constructed graph is a multi-relational graph, they apply a multi-relational GNN to encode the graph. Specifically, they propose a hybrid GNN, which runs the message passing on both static and dynamic graph. 
So let's look at the experimental results. Uh, as we can see, combining static and the dynamic graph performs better than just with uh, one of them. Um, okay, so that's conclude the, the part I'm talking about. Next, uh, um, we will talk about text clustering and matching. Um, Bang, please go ahead. Thanks, Inya. So I'll share my screen. Sorry, I need to set up the... Not yet. Yeah, security. And uh, I need to quit and uh, re-log in again to share the screen. Sorry, uh, just a few minutes. Okay. Yeah, meanwhile, if you have any questions, um, please free, feel free to type in the chat. Can you see my slides? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Hello, everyone. So next I will talk about uh, graph representations and learning for text clustering and matching. So as we know, like uh, in, today we have like the issue of information explosion. So usually we can like, for example, if we read news, we will use search engines or to search the topics we are interested in or receive documents from face news streams. But uh, usually they provide a list of documents which has several disadvantages. For example, we will have a mass document list with like extremely fine-grained articles. And because like the different articles are reported from different news media, so they may contain like redundant and more and even useless information. And they, we didn't have like a structured organization between these the different documents. So in the work of Story Forest, so we propose to organize the information of different events in terms of uh, event and the story. So basically here we shows a uh, like illustration. So let's say we used each node to represent a specific event, which is like something spe uh, happened at some specific time and location around a group of entities. And we organize the relationship according to the time and the correlation. So let's say here we show a story. So clearly a story is a tree of events to show the correlation structure. And let's say this is like the story about a presidential election in 2016. So start from like Trump becomes the presidential candidate until Trump is elected as the president. And we have some like highly coherent branches. So let's say this is about the news reports about the Hillary's health problem. And this is about like the mail door. So in this case, we can easily like have a big map about a complex story which contains different incidents. And we can track the evolution of these different events. So here shows the overall architecture of the Forest system. So briefly speaking, so we have like four modules we need to first pre-process the data and extract the keywords from the documents. So here we assume like we have a stream of news articles coming, so keep, keep coming. And we extract events from these news articles. And then we have a clustering algorithm to like divide the stream of uh, documents into uh, each fine-grained cluster of hot events. So what we do is like we design a two-layer graph-based clustering algorithm 
So the key idea is like, uh, we need to keep the granularity to just like the event scale. So in this case, the first level classification is based on keywords. So we divide the keywords based on the keyword co-occurrence graph. And we divide it into subgraphs by keyword community direction over keyword graphs. Then based on each subgraph of the keywords, we can assign documents or within news articles to each keyword community according to the similarity. So in this way, we have a first layer clustering and each cluster can be like considered as a topic, which is described by the keyword, sub, uh, keyword subgraphs. And in the second layer, like for each subcluster of the documents, we further construct the document graph according to like we calculate whether each pair of document is talking about the same event or not by a document pair classification module. And based on the document graph, we further perform communication again to divide each document graph into subgraphs. So now each subgraph of the documents, it represents an event. And finally, we have the growing story module. Basically, it means that we will grow story trees in an online manner. So we will check each new event cluster to existing story trees to see whether it belongs to one of the tree, whether it can be merged to one of the event node, or whether it's a new story and we initialize a new story tree. And finally, based on this, we can recommend it to different users. So the first uh, the version of like the story tree is like applied and deployed into the uh, initial version of the hot topic uh, list in the TensorQ browser. So here we show how it looks like. So let's say it will like provide a list of hot topics, like in a, basically early. So we will update the list like every hour, and then. Let's say this is uh, one of the hot topics with about Beijing Winter Olympic clothes. And if you click on it, you will see a list of correlated events. This is basically organized by uh, linear time instead of tree structure because it's better to visualize on, let's say, cell phone. And then if you click on, uh, this shows the whole a longer timeline of the Beijing Winter Olympics. So basically, if you click on each of these, you will see like more fine grained news articles about each specific event in this story. So this is uh, another work about like detecting uh, events from social media. So basically in this paper, uh, the author proposed a framework leverage the heterogeneous information network to organize event-oriented elements and relations of the various types into one unified graph structure. So we say, let's say this, we have like uh, have data from social media, or let's say Twitter and so on. And we construct a heterogeneous graph based on the different relationships. So here, each yellow node means a social post and they can be correlated in different relations. For example, they are posted by the same user or they like contains the same keywords or they happened in the same location. So in this way, we can construct a heterogeneous graph where the node are different social messages and the urges are like a different relations. Let's say the same user relation, same location relation or same keyword relation. So, and they will, uh, we can assign some kind of weights according to the importance and their similarity. And, so. and then the, in this part, the key idea is like, we want to uh, learn the embedding uh, for each social media based on this heterogeneous graph. So basically it leverages both intra uh, graph, uh, intra relation uh, embedding and the interrelation embedding. So basically the idea is like we can utilize multi-agent reinforcement learning to set up the strokes for each service type of event. So in this case, when we aggregate the message from its neighbors for each specific type of event, we can pay attention to the most relevant neighbors. So in this way, we have the intra graph in, uh, in relation embedding for each message node. Then we also have the interrelation aggregation module, which can combine the embedding learned through different type of relations to get the final uh, embedding. And after we get the embedding for each social media node, we utilize the contrastive learning 
uh, to further improve the representation of the each social media post. And finally, this the deep learning based uh, DBSCN custom algorithm is further proposed, which is like based on the DBSCN density clustering. So basically, the reinforcement learning here is further utilized to automatically learn the hyperparameters in this custom algorithm. So this work is published by uh, Professor Peng Hao and his team in TPAMI 2022. So uh, basically, like if we uh, we can see how this system works. So basically, like the this system is called the fine event uh, architecture. So it performs social event detection in an incremental life cycle mechanism. So in stage one, like uh, it constructs initial message graph and train the initial model for event detection. And in stage two and three, with new message come in, the message graphs and the detection model are updated incrementally a non-English message will be mapped to English uh, semantic space and use the same model for event detection. And in stage four, they use different strategies to maintain the message graph by remove some old and unrelated message and maintain a suitable graph scale for the algorithm efficiency. So here shows the uh, experimental results. So basically in both offline and online incremental event detection experiments, the fine event framework outperforms the uh, different baselines in terms of different metrics, like the normalized mutual information and adjusted mutual information and adjusted random index. So we refer the, to the paper for more detailed design of the framework. So, so basically, uh, we have talked about like how to cast the, the documents or social media into event clusters. So let's go back to the document casting. So basically, uh, in this system, there is a key step, which is like we need to compare the relationship between two documents. So basically, it's identify the relationship between two long documents, which is about like whether the two documents are talking about the same event or they are talking about the same uh, related events. So uh, previously, uh, the text matching algorithm is mostly works for short, short sentence. Uh, matching uh, and uh, for long document matching, we cannot directly utilize the methods developed for short sentence matching because, like, uh, to, to learn the representation of long documents is uh, is more flexible. And in this case, if we change the order of the different passages, the representation will change. So basically, the idea is like we utilize the idea of divide and conquer. So we divide the long document into several different parts, and we align the different parts of two documents to merge each local uh, part. And then we perform distributed matching and aggregate the matched results. So in this way, like we can handle the problem of the encoding of long documents and we can handle the flexible order because like we will align the corresponding parts in a pair of documents. And the time complexity, so with the incre increase of the document length, the time complexity will increase. So by dividing it into several different parts, the time complexity can be reduced. So basically we propose the, what we call the cost of interaction graph to represent the content uh, of one or two documents. So let's see, use this uh, toy document as an example. So first we extract the keywords. So here we just show the named entities in this uh, toy example. And then we will group the keywords into different keyword clusters. So we think that each keyword uh, uh, cluster in this document indicates uh, like a specific subtopic discussed in this document. And then we can assign each sentence to one of the keyword clusters. So if we have like two documents to compare, then we will have two lists of sentences from document A and document B. And finally, we will also construct urges between each keyword cluster. Well, each keyword cluster also associated with a list of sentences or two lists of sentences from two documents. So in this way, let's say if we have uh, two documents to compare, we want to know whether document A and document B are talking about the same event. So we first construct the concept of generation graph. So in this way, we have like each node 
which contains a, a community of keywords and also two lists of sentences from document A and document B. And then we perform feature extraction. So basically the feature extraction is about like, we want to compare the set of sentences for each node because like each node only contains a small amount of sentences from document A and B. So it's more close to short sentence matching. So this can be done by calculating different similarity features or by let's say train a Siamese neural network to match the uh, sentence list in each node. After that, we have a like graph representation of a document pair. Well, each node represents a local matching result. And then we aggregate all the local matching results based on graph convolution network to get the global aggregation vector. And based on this vector, we have a classification layer to classify whether they are talking about the same event uh, or similar uh, correlated events, or they are not relevant to each other. And these are trend end to end. So we compared the uh, concept of interaction graph based long document matching with uh, different baselines. We will see that. So let's say if you compare these two uh, ones, actually the only difference is like whether we divide the content into several parts or not. And we can see that by using graph representation and divide it, we actually greatly improve the performance by over 4% accuracy and F1 score on two data sets, which is the Chinese same event data set and the Chinese same story data set for long doc document matching. And if we compare like uh, these two, so if you compare these two variants, the key difference is like whether we utilize the graph convolution network to aggregate the local matching. As you can see, if we utilize this layer, it can actually improve the performance by more than four percentage. So in overall, the experiment shows that utilize decompose the long document into graph representation as well as aggregate uh, learn the whole representation of matching by graph convolution network both uh, significantly improve the performance. So we have discussed like how we can handle different news articles, uh, matching the relationship or clustering them into even clusters. So another problem is like how do researchers new to a field have a quick survey about the topic? So basically now we want to like have a cast of research papers. They are correlated to each other, but they are not the same. So basically if you are a researcher who is like new to a specific research topic and you want to do a literature review, so what you want to do is like to collect a set of up-to-date research papers as well as some important classical papers and they should give you a comprehensive overview about a specific topic. So if we only utilize Google Scholar, so it's not enough, it will provide us a list of research papers by search engine, uh, but uh, we don't know the reading order, so which paper we should start first. And if we read one paper, maybe we need to read some other papers as a prerequisite to better understand it. So here, uh, we analyzed like the Google Scholar search result for a lot of different uh, input searches. And we have like different, uh, some key observations. So observation one is that for the same topic, the articles directly returned from Google Scholar have a huge gap with the reference list of a survey. So we can think about a, a survey paper as a, like a human labeled uh, data, which provides like the papers uh, we can look at for a specific uh, topic discussed in the survey. So if you compare the reference list of a survey paper and like the search result using the same uh, key phrases for the same topic, we will see there is a big gap. And also, uh, although there is a big gap, big, uh, big gap between the two, uh, most of the missing papers can be retrieved through the neighbors, which is the one order or second order citations of the initial seasonals. So which means that, let's say, if you have a survey paper about, this is a survey paper, a survey on hate speech detection using natural language processing. So if you search hate speech detection and natural language processing in Google Scholar, you can, let's say, let's say we retrieve the top 20 papers. And we also have a reference list for this survey paper. If you compare these two lists, it doesn't overlap a lot. Usually, actually in this specific example, we only found the first paper is contained in the searching result. However, 
if you expand the seed papers uh, returned by Google Scholar by including the first and second order neighbors through the citation relationship. So let's say one and paper five. So there's an arrow here, which means paper one cited paper five. And what you find is that by including the two order neighbors, most of the papers in the reference list will be included. So in this way, directly relying on Google Scholar is not enough. We need to mine through this citation graph. So we define a new task, which we call the uh, reading pass generation. So basically given input key phrase, our goal is to learn a mapping function to generate a reading pass, which covers the reference papers as much as possible. And we also, uh, so for this task, we didn't like manually create the training data set. So basically, we can utilize existing survey papers as a data set. So let's say if you have a survey paper and it, it has title, and we can extract the keywords as a search query. And also it have a reference list. So this reference list can be served as a label. And also considering that not all the papers in the reference list is important to this survey, we can count the frequency, like how many times each referenced paper is mentioned in the paper. So in this case, we can create different versions of labeling. So for example, we can maintain the papers, ref referred papers, which shows uh, at least two times in this way as a gold standard list. So based on this idea, we created the survey bank data set and also collected the graph. So the survey bank uh, data set uh, contains like, uh, uh, more than 400 unique topic keywords. And uh, initially we have like uh, more than 41,000 survey papers. And finally, after many post-processing, we kept uh, more than 9,000 high quality survey papers with high quality uh, and kept in survey bank. And the citation graph is like, uh, we have initially uh, 80 million papers covering automates and there are 6 million uh, papers about computer science was kept and the citation graph linked by citation relationship and published time. So this work is published in this year's ICD. So here we show the, uh, so how we can, here we show the framework of like how we can construct the reading pass by our like uh, reading pass generation system. So we call it repurge system. So basically like, in step one, it's about a sub citation graph construction. So after acquiring the initial seed papers from Google Scholar and constructing the weighted citation graph, we capture the first order and second order neighbors of the initial seeds as candidate to form the sub citation graph with weighted urges and nodes based on the observation that most of the papers relevant to the query can be found among the first and second order neighbors of the initial seeds. So here the initial seeds are like let's say the top 20 uh, papers returned by Google Scholar. And so basically based on this initial seeds, so then we, or after we expanded the neighbors, so what we need to do is like, we relocate the initial seed. So here, the initial seed is returned by Google Scholar and we include the first and the second order neighbors. And then we keep the, let's say, highly correlated papers as a new seed, for example, here paper uh, 16, 7, uh, 13 is cited by paper 9 and paper 10, and also 15 cited by 11 and 12. So we reassign the seeds to so that like we can know better about uh, the prerequisite papers to understand a specific topic. And then uh, after we have obtained this new seeds, what we want to do is like we want to create a reading pass which includes all of these new seeds as well as like have the maximum weight over all the nodes and urges. So basically this is a problem what we call the node urge weighted standard tree problem. So what we want to do is actually solve this optimization problem. So let's say we define the cost of each urge and each node as like a CE, uh, the E is the urge and the W is the node. So here, Say uh, this like con j means the correlation between paper i and j. So for example, we can count like how many times uh, paper i cited j or j cited i. 
and we use this inverse as a cost. And here, the weight of node Y includes the page rank score from R to J, and the uh, like the value is important because like uh, the web paper published in a good value should have be more important. So this is the general heuristic. And so we want to minimize this overall cost so that we can uh, preserve the important papers as well as the strong correlations between them and form a complete graph, a complete path. So this shows a case study. So let's say uh, this is a really path generated by our newest model in terms of the query phase, the pre-trained language model. So we'll see actually the green nodes are some papers which is not returned by Google Scholar. So you can see, let's say we can see the bird paper is actually very important to pre-trained language model, but it's not included if you just uh, utilize pre-trained language model to search by Google Scholar. And also attention is all you need. So because this is a important prerequisite for pre-trained language models, so this is also returned by our system. So next, uh, we will talk about uh, graph representation and many for text mining and the classification. So our problem is like, uh, what users are interested in? So for example, if user input the query to estimate with any speech in a search engine, do we want to infer the user's interest? So what, what we have done is like, we create a web scale ontology to represent the user's interest and document the topics. So for example, here, this is a, shows the structure of the ontology. So let's say we have high level categories, it includes let's say current events, communications and so on. And then we have different concepts, entities and topics and events. So here, concepts represents a collection of things which share some common property. And the topics are a, a collection of events which are correlated to each other. So let's say we have different types of cell phones and then we have specific cell phone entities and we have topics and we have the special event within each topic. And the most important relationship in the ontology is, uh, is a relationship. So a specific event belongs to a topic or an entity belongs to a, like a concept. So this is the framework how we construct such an ontology. So let's see we, uh, if you have like the query and the document click graph, so basically if user input different queries and based on the search result, they will click the different documents based on the click relationship, we can have search click graph from the queries to documents. So basically this is a huge bi-party graph. And then we can divide it by query document cluster. Well, each subcluster includes a few highly similar queries and highly correlated documents. And we hope that from each a cluster, maybe we can mine a meaningful phrase which represents a concept or an event which denotes the main searching purpose of this query cluster. And based on the mined uh, phrases, we can form the nodes in this ontology and also mine the relationships based on knowledge graph techniques. And finally, if you have a, such kind of ontology, you can perform different things. For example, the story composition, because we have the relationship between different events and topics and document tagging, because we can like classify whether we can assign text to different documents to summarize its content and the query conceptualization. So if you your query contains some entity, maybe you actually interested in a general class of similar entity. For example, based on relationship between a specific entity and the concept, we can generalize the query to other entities belonging to the same concept. And this uh, can be utilized to improve the recommendation to different users. So a key research problem is like how we can mine the phrase from the query and documents. So basically we utilize the queries and document titles. So we found that uh, basically like a meaningful phrases will let's say a concept they will show up many times in the query and titles in a similar way, but maybe there were some like slightly difference. So basically we can modeling the query and titles into a heterogeneous graph where each node represents a unique word in either one of the query or one of the titles. 
and they can take similar relationship between them. So we also add a virtual start of sentence node and end of sentence node for the graph. So in this case, we can connect all the unique words in the query and titles into a heterogeneous graph. So if two words are adjacent to each other, in one of the title or query, we will add a sequential urge, which means from left to right, and this is the inverse direction. And if they are not adjacent to each other, but they have syntactic dependency between them, so we also add the syntactic dependency relationship. So in this way, we call this query title interaction graph. And then to mine the graph uh, phrase from such a interaction graph, what do we need to do is like perform node classification to extract the words between uh, belongs to the output phrase. And also we need to find a order to connect all the words to form the phrase. So this shows how, so basically, first we can classify the node based on the relational uh, convolutional graph, uh, graph convolutional network. Then let's say we have classified these three nodes belongs to the output phrase. We need to find an order to connect them. So, so basically this is a asymmetric traveling salesman's problem, which is like, we want to find a shortest path from start of sentence to end of sentence, and through this path, we will connect these three nodes. So this uh, problem can be solved by existing algorithm. So in this case, we can extract uh, uh, key phrases from queries and such uh, document titles. So this shows the application to fit new stream with the ontology. So it's uh, deployed to different uh, mobile apps. So let's see. This uh, document was about like thesis cars with less than two L per uh, 100 km fuel consumption and up to uh, 1,000 km recharge mate. So the tech concept is about like low fuel consumption cars. So you can see actually such kind of text can highly summarize the main content of the document, even though such kind of tag is not directly mentioned in the title or the content. And here's a small example. So let's say this paper, uh, we tag it as healthy receipt. And this paper, we tag it as like house price trends. So in this way, it's like uh, better to connect different uh, similar documents and match with the user's interest. Uh, then we talk about uh, how we can utilize graph representation for document classification. Uh, document classification. So here, let's say this in this work, they utilize the words and documents as different nodes, as urges contains like the co-occurrence relationship between WordPress or the TFIDF, which is like belong each word and the document contains it. And they model the graph with a graph convolutional network to perform document classification. So in this case, like because it contains all the different documents and the words, the document classification. Uh, document classification turns into the problem of node classification based on the uh, graph convolution network. And in this work, uh, so basically here, if you have a corpus of different documents, you form a big graph which contains all the documents. Each document is a node. So you can perform node classification for document classification. And another way is like we model each specific document as an individual graph. So, so Ben, I uh, sorry, I, I think we need to hurry up because I think we, we are running out of time. Okay, yeah, yeah, I will finish soon. Uh, so in, in this uh, work, we utilize uh, uh, words as the nodes and we utilize Cochrane's graph and we form graph level classification for text classification. And uh, basically the requirement shows that the graph structure is very useful for text classification. And uh, the last work we need to discuss is about uh, we can construct actually heterogeneous graph to represent a uh, text. For example, we can utilize the topics and the, the uh, short text as well as uh, different entities to form a heterogeneous graph. And in the work of the heterogeneous graph attention network, they utilize like dual level attention, which is like the first attention is about the relation type and second level is about the different nodes within each specific relation type to aggregate the information from all the neighbors. 
So to summarize, uh, the graph neural network includes the encode of multi-scale information, and it also uh, enables the encode of genetic information. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bang. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, let's talk. Uh, let's to move to the uh, demo session. Uh, let me first share my screen. Uh, okay. So yeah. So uh, by the way, please feel free to uh, ask your question in the chat so we can. Uh, we can like try to answer your questions uh, during the presentation. Um, yes, so next let's talk about the, uh, uh, let's have a demo session. So uh, let's first uh, take a, a deep dive into our graph for NLP library. So this is the first uh, open source uh, library uh, for the easy use of uh, uh, graph neural networks for NLP. So let's first have a, a like, a, uh, have like a, a, let's first uh, uh, briefly like uh, um, take a view of the history of the our library. So we uh, initially re released our uh, uh, like a v zero point four point one version uh, in uh, Janu uh, in June uh, twenty twenty one. So we have some internal we had some internal uh, versions before that, but this is our first uh, official uh, release. And then we uh, launched our DLG for NLP website where we listed a bunch of useful uh, resources like the survey paper, the library tutorial, and some relevant workshops. Then we released uh, uh, in uh, September, 2021, we released uh, the V0.5.1 library. And, uh, and uh, later, uh, early this year, we released our uh, uh, 0 0.5.5 uh, version where we support uh, like uh, uh, mm, we support like uh, uh, online inference, and we also uh, um, improved our library by separating the graph topology and the graph embedding. And there are many, uh, there were many more uh, improvements. So uh, we are planning to release our zero point six uh, version very soon. And in this new version, we will have a new configuration system. We will support the relational uh, graph neural networks and the uh, AMR graph construction. And by the way, there, there, are, uh, there are two uh, relevant workshops on DLG for NLP uh, coming soon. And uh, yeah, so um, I, um, going beyond that, like we will have more uh, graph for NLP uh, releases uh, in the future and we will, and we are, we will release and we will release a, a, a book dedicated on this uh, DLG for NLP topic. So this is the over, overall architecture of the graph for NLP library. So uh, at the bottom level, we have like uh, both CPU and GPU support. And uh, uh, our current uh, uh, library like uh, relies on the PyTorch uh, uh, framework, but we are planning to support uh, TensorFlow uh, in the future. Mm, and uh, we we build our library on the on the popular DGO, the Deep uh, Graph Learning uh, Library, which is a very uh, like a commonly used uh, uh, library for uh, deep learning on graphs purpose. And uh, um, as for our graph NLP, like a core components, we have the uh, graph data and the data set APIs at the bottom, and we have uh, different modules on like a graph construction graph. Uh, uh, embedding learning on the prediction, loss, and evaluation. And we have some high level uh, model, uh, model level APIs like the graph to sequence model, graph to tree models, so that you can directly call the high level APIs to, uh, for, to, to Im implement, uh, to build your GN based uh, NLP application uh, very quickly. And uh, um, on the top level, we have, made, we have implemented many, already implemented many. Uh, NLP applications by uh, using the graph neural networks. So those applications include uh, like test classifications, semantic parsing, machine translation, KG completion, uh, natural language generation, and so on. So, uh, 
so these are the key features uh, of the library. So it's easy to use and quite flexible. So we already uh, provided the four implementations of some state-of-the-art uh, models. And, uh, and also we provide a flexible interface to build and customize the models with whole uh, pipeline support. Mm. And we, we share a rich set of learning resources like the survey, uh, the, the documentation of the library, the tutorials, the videos, and so on. So our library is, has, um, has like a high learning efficiency ex and extensibility. So it, it is built on the highly optimized uh, runtime libraries, including the, the DGL, DGL library. And we provide a comprehensive code examples for you to quickly ramp up our uh, library. So we were planning to uh, release this uh, 0 0.6 uh, version soon. So this is the data flow of the, the library. So we, we are given raw data and we will have graph construction module to convert the raw data to a graph uh, uh, by using either like a static graph construction or dynamic graph construction approaches. Then we have, uh, have uh, provided many like GN APIs to, to encode the graph structure data and learn the, the node embeddings and the graph embeddings. Then we have some prediction uh, modules to, um, to, to produce the task specific uh, outputs. And we have some uh, invalidation metrics and loss functions to uh, already available to use. So uh, here's the computation uh, flow of the graph for NLP library. So given a test sequence or uh, our input graph. So we can choose to either use static graph construction to convert the, the input data to a graph, or we can choose to use dynamic graph construction to dynamically uh, learn the graph structure and, uh, on, the, uh, and on the fly. And we can also use both the static graph construction and the uh, dynamic graph construction. Um, as we previously like mentioned, so uh, by this way, we can utilize we can take advantage of both the benefits of static and the dynamic graph construction. So basically, we can combine the implicit learning graph structure with the intrinsic static graph structure to, to get our uh, um, optimized graph structure. So uh, once we have this uh, constructed graph structure, we will have this uh, like a graph embedding initialization module to initialize the node or edge embeddings. Then we have this uh, uh, graph learning module, uh, which uh, we provide a bunch of building GNs like a GCN, G, uh, GAT, uh, GGN, graph stage, and so on. And uh, as for the uh, prediction module, uh, we provide, uh, we provide uh, like no, no classifier, uh, like a graph classifier or, or like a, a sequence uh, decoders to, to, to support uh, like a different types of uh, downstream tasks. So we also uh, and for the sequence decoder or the tree decoder, uh, we, we, we already provide uh, supports for the, uh, some common uh, mechanisms like the attention mechanism, copy mechanism, and the coverage mechanism. So we evaluated our um, uh, library on various tasks um, with various student models, uh, graph construction strategies to produce a state-of-the-art results. And uh, this is the overview of the, the hierarchy of the library. So um, as for the modules, uh, we, we have like graph construction, graph embedding initialization, like graph embedding learning, prediction uh, modules and so on. And uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, like we provide high level, uh, like model level APIs, like the graph to sequence, graph to tree uh, APIs. And we are planning to support the graph to graph uh, API in the future. And we have uh, already supported a bunch of uh, NLP applications. So uh, let's quickly uh, go through the, some major uh, uh, modules of the library. So one is the graph construction module. So we support both static and the dy dynamic graph construction modules. So as for the static, we support as dependency, constituency, and IE graph construction. And we will support the AMR graph construction in, in our next release. So for dynamic graph congestion, um, we support both the node embedding based and the node embedding uh, based to refine the dynamic graph congestion. So this node embedding based refined graph congestion is essentially 
uh, trying to combine the benefits of static and the dynamic growth construction. So uh, next, let's talk about the growth embed initialization module. So uh, this module is uh, aims to basically initialize the node embeddings because uh, node embed initialization is very important for the overall model performance. Uh, and we already, uh, we, we support both the single token or market token node, node embed initialization or uh, edge embed initialization. So we provide many uh, building strategies to, to do the initialization. Um, next, let's talk about the graph embedding learning module. So we supported some uh, common GN variants like GCN, GAT, graph stage, and the GGNN. And uh, we support both the unit directional and the bi directional uh, GNNs. So for bi-directional, we support like a bi-fuse, bi-step. So these are some common um, bi-directional GN variants. And uh, 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 in order to enable like a dynamic graph construction, like we provided this use edge weight parameter. So and for the prediction module, we uh, provide, we support to both classification and the generation use cases. And we, uh, as I mentioned, like we, we provided some building high level graph to sequence graph to two APIs. So these are uh, like basically config in and model out. You can easily build a, 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 like a GM based uh, uh, graph to sequence graph to two application for NLP tasks. So we have uh, provided many like building data set of types to support a different uh, scenarios like a text to text means text in text out. Uh, text to tree means like texting uh, tree structure out. Okay, so we also uh, provide some uh, inference wrapper to enable online inference uh, deployment like easily. So this this is basically allows this basically allows like raw data in and the final prediction out. Um, okay, so let's uh, do some like demos. So the first demo is on text classification. Uh, application. So um, in order to run a demo, you will need to go to uh, this uh, GitHub repository and uh, follow the get, get started instructions to install the uh, library. So, uh, so here's the, uh, here's the, uh, the, the, de the demo like repository. So, so uh, you can follow these instructions to install the, the library. And then uh, you can go to this uh, test clarification uh, um, like a, a demo, and you can, if you already uh, install the, the graph to uh, graph on your library, you can directly run this demo by click like sell run all. So in this tutorial, uh, in this tutorial demo, so we use the graph on your library to build a GM based uh, test class classification model. So this model consists of a graph congestion module and a graph embedding module and as a prediction module. So um, and we use the building module APIs to build the model. So let's uh, go back to the slides to take a deeper look into uh, some important uh, components of the uh, of this uh, demo. So here's how we can I mean uh, build this overall architecture of the model. So we, we here we have this uh, graph embedding initialization module, which will be able to initialize the node embeddings. So then we call this. Uh, uh, we can optionally call this dynamic graph construction module. If we want to turn on the dynamic graph construction, then we can call this GN uh, module. And, call, and then we finally we call this uh, graph classification module. So all these modules, we already provide uh, building um, APIs for these different modules. And you can easily initialize uh, those, in, uh, create, you, can, in, you can easily like call these uh, uh, modules. So here just uh, uh, how we can like uh, call different modules, like for example, this graph embedding initialization API. And uh, this is how we can call uh, a graph construction API to quickly uh, build a, uh, uh, either a dynamic static graph or dynamic graph. So by the way, this also can be easily customized. Um, so here's an example. We can call a uh, graph stage API to build a, a to create a a, a, a GN, uh, like instance, and this is a prediction API uh, 
uh, core example. Uh, and we provide a various building options. And this can also be easily customized. And this is a data set API. Yeah, uh, let's, uh, let's move to the next demo. So uh, this demo is a mass word um, problem. So um, in this demo, like uh, we, uh, we can easily uh, call our graph to sequence uh, uh, API to build a model for the task of mass word problem. So a uh, mass word problem like aims to infer reasonable questions from a given natural language problem description. Mm, and, the, and the, this module like consists of a graph construction module, a graph embedding module and a prediction module. So since we, the library already provides the graph to tree API, so we don't need to build each of the uh, components as what we did in the previous text, like text clarification uh, demo. Instead, we can just call the building graph to tree uh, model API to build the model. Uh, let's go back to the slide. So, yes, yeah, so, uh, so here's how we can call the graph to tree uh, model level API. So it's just a, a single line of code. Yeah, so that's for the uh, demo session. So since we are already running out of time, so let's quickly uh, wrap up. So, so I, I, um, as we can see, like it's the, uh, the, the GN plus NLP is really a trending uh, research topic. So, uh, so on the IKEA 2020 submissions, like the graph, the keywords graph neural networks and, and NLP have the, the greatest uh, growth. And uh, like, even though um, like uh, researchers have, has, have been like working on this uh, exciting topic for a few years, there are still some, uh, there are still some like, um, uh, promising uh, research uh, directions to pursue. One is graph construction for NLP. So there are many, uh, there are few like questions, remaining questions uh, for graph construction for NLP. For example, the dynamic graph construction are largely unexplored uh, for NLP and uh, how to effectively combine the advantages of static graph and the dynamic graph is also an interesting uh, problem. And how to construct a heterogeneous dynamic graph is very interesting. And also how to make dynamic graph construction scalable. Um, these are all very like challenging yet important uh, problems. So um, scaling GNs to large graphs is also a very, uh, very interesting uh, research direction. Most existing multi-relational or heterogeneous GNs have, uh, will have like scalability issues when applied to large graphs uh, in NLP, such as uh, large graph. And also uh, how to combine GNs and the transformers in NLP is also uh, an interesting uh, direction because nowadays transformers have been uh, widely uh, uh, used in for many NLP tasks and have already achieved a great success. And, uh, and, like, uh, and how to effectively combine the advantages of GN and the transformers um, I mean, it's also very uh, interesting uh, problem. And I think another interesting direction is per training GNs for NLP. And uh, recently there are some uh, works on like uh, uh, knowledge enhanced per trained language models using graph neural networks for encoding the heterogeneous knowledge sources. I think this is an um, interesting and underexploited uh, direction for uh, portraying genes for NLP. And also graph to graph learning is uh, underexploited in NLP. So uh, I already mentioned a few uh, nice uh, graph to graph uh, um, applications in information extraction, but still there are large uh, uh, like opportunities here. And also uh, how to join to join a text and a KG reasoning in NLP is, is also is another very interesting uh, research direction. And, uh, and another interesting research direction is how to incorporate the source and the context into knowledge graph construction and the verification. So um, let's, uh, so, um, let's like, uh, summarize the, this tutorial. So uh, deep learning on graphs for NLP is a fast growing area today. So since graph can naturally encode the complex information, it could bridge a gap 
uh, by combining um, both the em empirical, dom em empirical domain knowledge and the power of deep learning. So for NLP task, how to convert the text sequence into the best graph uh, and how to determine like the proper graph representation techniques. So those are all still some remaining questions. So um, our graph for NLP library aims to make either use of GNs or NLP. So we have listed a bunch of uh, useful learning resources here. So uh, you could take a look into this uh, like after the tutorial if you have interest. Yeah, uh, thanks for your um, attention uh, to our tutorial. Um, I'm not sure if there are still uh, some questions here. So if you have uh, any question, yeah, please feel free to unmute yourself. And thank you so much yeah, for everyone here stay so long uh, with us. Any question? Okay, so if you know, okay, uh, some question here. What are limitations of GM for NLP? Yeah, so since you used to talk about some long time, uh, do you want to answer the question? Yeah, sure. So uh, the question is, what are limitations of GNs for NLP? I, I would say like, I, I would like to refer, rephrase these questions as like, what are some uh, re remaining challenges of applying uh, graph neural networks to uh, to NLP tasks? So I, as, I, I, as I mentioned, like, uh, I, I think one such uh, challenge is graph construction because uh, uh, in order to have like a good uh, over a good good like a performance on some downstream tasks you have to have a good graph representation um, and uh, how to convert the text to graph representation it remains a challenging uh, problem and another uh, challenge is scalability so um like in in, in some NLP applications the the actually the, the, the input graph has a very large size. For example, in uh, in knowledge graph, there could be millions of like nodes, like edges. So applying graph neural networks to such a large graph is very uh, it's very challenging. And uh, I think uh, so. These are two I think major challenges of applying graph neural networks to NLP. But there are still there could be some uh, other. Uh, non-trivial uh, challenges, like uh, um, I think uh, other people might want to jump into the conversation. Yeah, uh, Yuyang and Bang, if you have anything to add, please feel free to add. Yeah, from my point of view, I actually I also think like the graph construction is a challenge for like applying GMS for NLP. So as we know nowadays, the foundation model, so all we call the pre-trained language models, they can utilize a large amount of, let's say, the uh, uh, sequential text data. But for graph-based NLP, so it is more suitable when we have like a more clearly defined uh, graph nodes and relationships. So an uh, interesting topic to explore in the future is like how we can compare the pre-trained language model and the graph neural networks so that they can work better together to utilize both the explicit relationships as well as like uh, discover the implicit relationship from unlabeled text. Yeah, I just want to um, second uh, what has been talked about before. I would say in my view, right, the biggest challenge to apply graph neural network in practice to, for solving practical NLP problem is really scalability. Uh, I think that's one significant part in terms of runtime performance. Uh, and the second thing is also I feel um, there are a lot of heuristics and uh, tuning needed to decide, you know, how to construct the node and the edges, um, and all, even even you know, there's, there's different design choices, right? Like how do we automate that? Uh, so there's some work ongoing on auto ML for NLP, 
uh, I haven't seen much in terms of applying that in the graph neural network space. I think that could be an interesting area to explore, you know, since uh, giving a wonderful tutorial we have done the very good foundation of the, the, search, the search space. Like how can we, giving a problem, right? How can we help people to decide what's the right design for, for the graph neural network for their use case? Okay, any other first question? Yeah, please feel free either post in the chat or you know, I'm yourself and ask. Okay, if no one have any question, uh, so uh, then uh, let's, uh, I will really need to uh, thank everyone to stay with us. Uh, so now uh, this is uh, a series of the tutorials that we have been presented last year and this year. Um, so our goal is uh, just simply want to, you know, bring uh, our people's attention about the deep learning on graph technique uh, for uh, different ALP applications. And uh, so uh, we will post uh, our slides and uh, video um, on our website. And uh, so uh, if you are interested about uh, this type of um, technique, so please feel free to, uh, to visit our DLG for NLP uh, website and find what you need. Um, so probably that's all for today. Um, yeah, I really also want to give my special thanks to uh, Yao and the Bang and Yu and Ji, sorry, left here. So to have a great uh, um, experience to work with all, 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 uh, with all of you and uh, to present this tutorial. Uh, this is the uh, best tutorial I have, I have ever done in, um, in my, uh, in all my, all my career. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Liu Fei. It's also our pleasure to work with you together and we we'll have a chance to present this topic to all the audience. And thanks everyone for your participation in our tutorials. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Bye-bye.